He was a very powerful king until he was betrayed for someone he never expected. He thought it was the end, but he reborn in a world where magic exists. Now he is a baby and he is planning to use all his knowledge to rise to the top. Our protagonist a man called Grey. He didn't believe that silly myth about when a person has a close encounter with death they can see the light at the end of the tunnel until he experienced it himself. He was watching the city from the top like any other day. He is a king after all. But for any odd reason he was very tired so he went to sleep. The thing is that he never woke up again. Someone murdered him. He had no idea who might be. Could be anyone. The truth is that he has a lot of enemies but that didn't matter right now. He was living it in the real life. That famous light at the end of the tunnel. And the first thing he notices when he reaches the light is that he was being born. He was being reborn as a little baby called Arthur. His parents were those two kind people. Her mother called Alice who in addition of being a very gentle person and good-hearted, she took the reins of her family. And his father Reynolds was a reliable and charismatic man but a little childish from time to time. Our protagonist was thankful for being born in a very lovely family but at the same time he just went through a suffering that he wouldn't wish to even his enemies. Not being able to control his limbs freely. Not being able to control his toxic wastes and having a weak body that couldn't even take a scratch. Before we continue, I want to make clear that our protagonist's past name is Grey but in this new life his name is Arthur. So we will name him Arthur from now on. Arthur had so many questions about where he was born. But he knew that these people speak the same language as he does. It was something but the weird thing is that they all were wearing armor. They carried weapons and buildings seemed to be pretty ancient. All that made him think that he was born sometime in the past. But his theory falls completely when he sees his mother healing her wounds using magic. That's right. He was born in other world. A world where magic exists. In his past life he was a powerful king. Led it armies. Won wars and even defeated every country's representatives in one versus one duels. But nonetheless he never was so proud about himself as he was now. He just learned how to crawl. Arthur needed to know more about the world he was in. As he just learned how to crawl he starts to sneak out by night to his father's library. He was in a continent called Dickathan which is formed by three big kingdoms. Elenoir which is ruled by elves and is located deep in the forest. Darth, ruled by dwarves and located below earth and last. Sapin, human's kingdom and the most populated out of the three. Also, this world has a monarchical system but in this world you don't get to be a king the same way you do in Arthur's world. Here that rank is inherited. Arthur also finds out that this world is technologically highly underdeveloped. But that's because of magic. In his past world there is an inner force called Kai that after a lot of training you could use to strengthen their bodies and weapons. Since in this world there is a similar force called Mana. The difference is that there is not only an inner one, but also surrounding us. The most common methods for using Mana is to power up or to cast. Enhancers use their Mana to power up their bodies and obtain a big strength, defense and agility. But their weakness lies in their short range but the spellers cast their Mana to the exterior and can bend the environment. Yet they have to supplement their own man core with exterior mana to cast a spell. Normally, spellers can manipulate one of the four elements, but there are some that can cast different spells. They are known as diverters. And one good example is Arthur's mother who can use healing spells. Something important to highlight is that the ability to use magic is something genetic. Only one of every 100 kids are born with the ability to use magic. The first sign of it happens between puberty and the end of adolescence. The time where mana core is revealed. All of this about the mana core seemed so similar for him just like the Kai core back in his world. The difference is that in his world, kids were trained to gather every different fragments of their inner Kai so then they could build the whole circle. While here, they let everything to happen naturally. So Arthur asks himself if he could do the same thing he did in his word but with the mana core. He closes his eyes. He focuses and effectively he can see a bunch of little mana fragments living within him. And just as he did back in his world. He starts to gather them all to create a core, though this attempts were always interrupted when his mother noticed. Since then, two years had passed, her mother noticed that her son was a little different from the rest. He loved to go to the city but not for toys and candy but to get into the armory. He loved to be there and also he had this estranged vice of sneaking out into the studio anytime he could. Her mother was worried about what kind of man he would become in the future. She had to be a very strict mother to avoid his son to get into trouble. She could not trust in Reynolds after all. The guy wanted to teach him how to fight since he was just crawling. Arthur started studying his father and realized quickly that he was an enhancer. It would normally take him three minutes of concentration just to carry some simple rocks. His father used to train in the courtyard and he often used to make a mess. For example this time he took out an enormous tree. Her mother came out to see what was happening and Arthur takes advantage of this to continue his training. During these two years he had progressed a lot with his core and he was about to make it. Arthur now knew why that used to take up to the adolescence to make it. 
because these fragments come together very slow. But Arthur forced it and he manages to make it in just two years. The whole house blows into pieces. Reynolds protects her wife quickly but she could only think about his son. Art is still inside. Reynolds runs as fast as possible but once he passed all the debris he can't believe what he sees. A worried Alice gets close to see what was happening. She also gets impressed when she sees what her two-year-old child has awoken. Arthur felt great. His body didn't feel weak as before until he realized that his whole house had been destroyed. From that moment many things changed. His mother started teaching him how to read and write. His father taught him the magic basics and also physical training, though it was difficult because of his body. At three years old his father gave him a wooden sword and started training physical combat. He had to train every day and he couldn't do what he wanted until he finished his sessions. And what he wanted to do wasn't playing video games or read manga but to keep studying. The level of strength in this world is measured by the mana core's color. It starts being black because of the blood and other impurities mixed when the core is just formed but as impurities gets filtered. The core becomes more pure, the order is the following, black, red, orange, yellow, silver and the strongest of all, white. Every color has three phases, dark, solid, and clear, that is to say. To advance from red to orange the person must go through dark red, solid red and clear red. And their son was an exceptional prodigy and his father thought that he was limiting his potential by teaching him alone instead of taking him to the right mentor. So he tells his wife that it is time to send him to the big city of Zyrus. Alice completely disagreed with that because his son was only four years old and she wasn't planning on send him alone to another city. Until Arthur gives them an idea to just move out together. They thought that how couldn't they think about that before. So now everything was solved. They decided to leave the next day since their old friends, the Twin Horns, would travel to Zyrus as well. Finally Arthur could get out from that little and calm town. The next day, a proud Reynolds introduced his lovely son to his friends, Adam Crench, an enhancer specialized in the use of spears, Angela Rosa, a spellcaster specialized in wind magic, Durden Walker, a giant spellcaster specialized in earth magic, Jasmine Flamesworth that besides being just like Akame, she is an enhancer specialized in the use of double daggers. Last but not least, Helen Shard, an enhancer specialized in magic archery. So now the journey begins. The road to Zyrus City is long and dangerous. That's why it is prudent to travel with company. During nights, the boys protect themselves from wild animals and at the same time they hunt them to eat. Helen was curious about Arthur so she starts talking to him, being amazed by his great achievements at his short age. Adam seems to be jealous and ask Reynolds to train a bit with his child. He says yes but to be careful. Now poor Arthur is kidnapped. Arthur tries to tell to his father to get him out of there with his eyes but his father didn't even notice. So given the situation, he has no choice but to fight. So using his past knowledge he gets into combat position and immediately attacks the redheaded. Adam was standing confidently waiting to block the little one's attack but Arthur suddenly disappears. Adam couldn't believe it. He had positioned himself at his back and now he couldn't defend himself but little Arthur misses and loses his balance. The battle continues and watch this fancy dodge. Just after that he rushes into his opponent to tackle him. Once in the floor he jumps to hit the final blow but Adam was waiting for him with an unexpected kick that Arthur barely manages to avoid. Now it was him who was on the floor. The redheaded approaches and attacks him with everything he has got. Luckily Arthur manages to block it, but he suffered the most because of his little body. The giant hits the redheaded for exceeding, but the redheaded says that exceeding my ass, and asks Reynolds what kind of evil training he did to this poor boy to making him a monster. But Reynolds says that he actually didn't taught him that. Arthur lies saying that he learned that from his father and reading some books. So now the other were interested in learning some of his moves and techniques. A lot of days had passed since the beginning of their journey. The training he was giving it to Helen. Adam and his father was progressing well. But the one that had advanced the most was Jasmine. She had learned some Arthur's techniques. She even unexpectedly learned his particular way of running and with that, the relationship between Arthur and Jasmine was getting stronger. She even gave him a birthday present. Yes, Arthur's birthday was during the journey. While on their way, Arthur was being stalked by Jasmine who wanted to suck up all of his knowledge. Some bandits attacks them. Anglia protects the carriage with her wind magic and now everyone being mad they prepare to attack. The problem is that they were completely surrounded. There were some bandits that planned to steal everything they had and to kidnap the women and children to sell them. Arthur was so mad, but her mother doesn't let him out since he is just a baby. On the other hand, his father starts to beat up bandits like if it was a sport, although he almost loses it but Helen saves him in last minute. Jasmine and Adam doesn't fall behind. They were pulverizing all those madmen, but Jasmine faces a hard opponent. It was a mage who fought with a whip. Being a dagger user the reach difference was against her. Arthur was thinking about a way to help her when suddenly his father was hurt by the bandit's leader. Arthur hurries his mother to go and heal him but weirdly she couldn't use her powers as she used to. Reynolds says don't worry, those wounds were not mortal. 
He even says to his son that once her mother finished her spell he should protect her and escape since he had enough strength to beat the bandit's leader, but he couldn't do it if he had to worry about both of them. Arthur refused to escape and tell his father that he can fight and he knows it so he would be staying and supporting them and his father says that the reason why he wants him to protect her is because she is pregnant. Now he understood his behavior during the whole journey and he now accepts his mission without a doubt. The enemy realizes that Alice was a healer so their boss orders that she must not escape. Arthur starts running with his mother. One of the bandits jumps over her but Adam stops him so they could keep moving. An archer shots them from the distance but Arthur manages to stop the arrow losing his sword in the process. The archer couldn't believe what he saw. A kind stopping his attack. But Helen manages to take him with an arrow and Arthur and his mother keeps running. But Arthur notices something strange. The bandits were supposed to have four mages but he could only see there of them. Where was the last one? And now at the top of the mountain he sees a water bender. This sucker cast a spell on them. He could stop the attack if he used mana but her mother would not be fast enough to make it so Arthur makes a decision to sacrifice himself to save her. But one sure thing is that he wouldn't fall alone. So before being hit he ties up a strand of mana into his knife and incredibly he manages to get the spellcaster who attacked them. The bastard tries to grab to a rock to avoid falling but he couldn't. The giant tries to save Arthur with his magic rock but he couldn't reach them. Arthur was happy because he knew that everyone else would be fine but he can't help feeling bad because he really wanted to be an older brother. And while he was falling we can see a bit from his past life. His old world was a world filled with problems. Low birth rate and recourses were limited. Wars were replaced by grief and armies for kings. Grey was a king but in truth, the ones who ruled were the council members. They were the ones who managed the country, both in politics and economy. Arthur had enough of that and one day he decided to leave the throne. He dedicated all of his life in becoming the strongest. But why? At the end of the day he still was an orphan who lost everything he loved and if he had the opportunity he would give it all to go back to a sperm and to be with everyone again. But it was impossible. This was the end. Or maybe not. Since for any odd reason Arthur managed to survive. The bandit wasn't so lucky. The problem is that he was injured and had no idea where he was. With little strength he managed to eat a bit and to drink some water. The he closes his eyes and he goes to rest. When he wakes up he was feeling better and he can stand up on his feet. He grabs the things that still works and looking back at what happened he couldn't believe that he survived a fall like that. He didn't know how much time had passed nor where he was, but the only thing he could do was to keep going. On his way he hears a voice that was happy to see him awake and asked him if he was alright. There was nothing and nobody near who could be talking. The only thing lying there was the bandit's body so he got scared and tries to check on him to see if he is still alive. Arthur is relief but Arthur realizes that this voice was still unknown so he guards up. Ask who was there and if that someone was the one who saved him. The voice says yes, that she saved him but if he wanted to know who she was, he had to find out once he arrived home. Arthur asks why should he obey and the voice says that she is the only one who could take him home. So Arthur attitude changes and starts to talk to the voice more respectfully. The voice liked that new attitude so she shows him the way. Now that he knew where to go, he starts moving immediately since the woods is a safer place when there is light. On his way Arthur starts asking to himself what kind of magic she could use to save him. Also who could she know where they were going to land and why did she only saved him? The more he thought about it the more questions he had. On his way, Arthur finds a river and he can't help but to enjoy it a bit. The voice says he is reckless for doing that. Arthur immediately cover his parts but the voice says that he shouldn't worry. There wasn't much to see anyways. Arthur's pride was hurt but a king should always be calmed and still. He finally reached the right place. The voice welcomes him. Arthur confused said hello to the giant mountain and the voice says that it would be interesting but she was not that bunch of rocks. Arthur entered the cave and after falling he finally meets his savior. She was intimidating. She was a Pekka's. She starts to get close to him. Arthur can't help to be scared and he starts to get back but she really wanted to heal him. Then she says that she would create a dimensional portal strong enough to send him home. It would take a long time but meanwhile he could eat from the plants and spices she had inside. He appearance was horrific but the truth is that she was kind. Arthur asks her name. Her name is Sylvia and now he can't stop asking her questions. Which she answers gladly. Where were they? They were in a little zone between the clearing of beasts and the forest. Nobody knows that zone because she has been protecting it. Why is she alone? She was alone because she didn't have anyone to be with. She had many enemies looking for her and in her last fight they injured her pretty bad while she was escaping and lastly she answers why she saved him. To be honest she didn't even know. Maybe because she was moved by his sacrifice and bravery. Or simply because she felt alone. Now she retires and goes to heal her wound so she could start working on the portal tomorrow. But before she goes she told him that his family and friends were safe. He shouldn't be worried. With time their relationship grew stronger. When Sylvia wasn't working on the portal they would eat. 
play or they just talked. Maybe she looked like the devil himself but she was kind and gentile. But she also reprimanded him when he was wrong just like a mother does. Like this one time when Arthur showed his hate for those bandits and how much he wanted to kill them. Sylvia hit him but she says that he is right. They deserve to die but he should not let hatred and vengeance thoughts dominate his mind because it will ruin his life. The hours became days and the days became weeks. Sylvia's wound seemed to be worse with time but she tell him not to worry. That it was normal. That normally her wound would get infected but nothing to be worried about. She was wandering about his core because normally humans grow theirs at 12 or 13. So why? A proud Arthur says that he is a genius and then Sylvia says that maybe he could learn from this. It was about absorbing mana while moving. Even if he is very good at fighting. Arthur can't understand how is he able to do that and Sylvia explains that human's way of thinking is very flat when it come to mana and it is something very basic for beasts. They learn it naturally but because humans take too long to awake it. They can't manage to comprehend it well. But this is not Arthur's case and he maybe could do it. So exit it. He now starts to practice but it is more difficult than he thought but with time he finally manages to do it. The problem is that when he goes to tell Sylvia she fall on the ground in a puddle of blood. Arthur immediately runs to help her. He couldn't understand why her wound gotten worse so bad. So he looks at the portal and sees that is finished. And then he understood. She was sacrificing herself to create the portal. Sylvia tells him to calm down not to cry anymore. They had little time together left and there was no point in wasting the time blaming himself. But Arthur says how not to. She was dying just to help him. She says that in fact he is doing her a favor. Now she could leave that cave faster and Sylvia shows her real form. She was a dragon. Arthur was speechless and even though he had a lot of questions, there was no time. Sylvia had to use her real form to complete the portal. But now that she had showed her form, they would come for her. Arthur couldn't understand anything. But she get out what it seems to be an egg and gives it to him along with a feather that should hide his aura. Then she touches his chest and some marks appears in his hands. Sylvia says that with this, everything will be revealed at the right moment. The portal was ready. She didn't have the time to make it directly to his home but he should be able to arrive to a place with humans nearby. Suddenly debris starts to fall down and a dark voice is heard. Someone had appeared to take Sylvia. It was another Pekka. Then Sylvia casted a spell that seemed to stop time and she apologizes to Arthur because the truth is that she prolonged the time when making the portal just to spend more time with him and as a last favor she asked him to call her grandma. And between tears he says to forget that. That she has to take advantage since the time was stopped to escape from there. He didn't care about the past. But Sylvia says that she can't do that and pushes him to the portal. And while getting away and seeing Sylvia getting far from him, Arthur calls her grandma and she happy thanks him for everything. Arthur appears in an unknown place. He was on the floor and has no motivation to getting up. His mind was melancholic about those four months he lived with her. But something gets him up. It was her voice. She survived. But not really. It was only a message left by her. It was a bit frustrating but Sylvia says that he is not ready for the truth. His body was a child's one and even with his core being dark red, he wasn't strong enough. Before dying, Sylvia left him a gift, her special will, and says that his future development as magician will be up to how good he uses her gift. Even though Arthur didn't care, he wanted her to be alive. Sylvia could see how Arthur might be feeling. Pain, anger, guilt, but she reminds him that he has a family to take care of and a purpose to fulfill. The only thing she asks is that he becomes a man that her and his parents could be proud of and lastly, she says that he will receive more news when his core has passed the white face. In that moment she will explain everything. But the most shocking thing is when she says goodbye, calling him King Grey. Now Arthur is filled with questions. Since when she knew about his identity, how did she know? But it was useless. He wouldn't get any answers. He rather gets up and start exploring the forest to know where he is. He climbs up to the top of a tree and realizes that he was inside Elshire Forest. Sylvia told him that she would send him to a place near humans. So he didn't understand why he was there and suddenly he hears a scream. Arthur rushes. It must be humans. And from the top he manages to see their carriage. What a luck. Maybe he could be friends with them but when he gets near something disturbs him. So he listens closely and his suspicions are confirmed. They were slave traders. They were happy because they caught a female elf. Female elves worth a lot in the market. Especially this one. Because she was a kid and she probably was a virgin. Arthur was very angry but looking at the bright side. It was an opportunity for him to distress a bit. Arthur wanted to kill them so bad but he didn't act immediately. Even for him, facing the four of them would be difficult so he followed them, waiting for an opportunity, eating energy to then make a move. The night had come and it was now or never. Arthur took some kind of seed and threw it to distract the wolves. The wolves start to behave like crazy and just as he wanted. One of the kidnappers gets out to try and calm them. Arthur didn't have any weapons so he had to use a method from his old world. He didn't know if would work but luckily it did. 
he created a magic knife using just his mana, quietly he went down from the tree and before the guy could talk he murdered him, grabs him before he hits the floor to avoid noises and thanks him for the weapon. Now the wolves are taking care of the body. The guy took a lot of time to return so one of the other kidnappers goes out to see what happened. When he sees that scene he can't help being in shock. But Arthur appears before he could say anything. Fighting with that body was exhausting but he must finish with the others while they were sleeping but the elf brings down his plan when she starts screaming for help. The other two guys left wakes up and they start looking for their friends. One of the see Arthur and rushes into him. But Arthur was more powerful so he left him out of combat easily. The guy screams out of pain alerting the last of them. The guy warns him saying that the boy was a magician but instead of being scared, the bastard gets happy. A magician boy is very rare and he might get more money with him than the girl. So he shows him that he is also a magician and please avoid being hurt. In a blink of an eye he gets behind Arthur but he dodges him. The guy rushes again but Arthur breaks his hips with a rock. He also threw the knife but the bastard grabbed it like it was nothing. He was fast. Our protagonist manages to defend himself but he still hit him with a kick and the guy grabs it. He just grabbed his gold mine but Arthur came up with something in mind. To condense his mana and create a sword. It was pretty similar to wine magic. Maybe fire magic could be condensed as well. So he tries and manages to create a strong explosion. Now the guy was really furious. He didn't care about selling him. He was going to kill him. But before he could start talking, Arthur beats the shit out of him. The last bastard begs him for forgiveness but Arthur has no mercy for people like them. It was difficult but he finally did it. Now he goes to the child and with a smile in his face he frees her. Even though he carries her blindfolded all the way. He didn't want a child to see all that terrible scene. After a long walk they reach a safe place and Arthur removes her blindfold. The girl is moved and she thanks him for everything. Arthur say that he needs to get back home and that the bad guys wouldn't chase her anymore. It is supposed that elves are safe in that forest but the girl says that that's not the case. That beast always scares them. Arthur gives up and he ends up agreeing to accompany the girl and he didn't even know where she lived. Arthur leaves her alone for a moment while he is searching for supply for their journey. He gets back to the bandit's carriage and takes everything that might be useful. He doesn't know how much they will be traveling so the more he carries the better. The carriage was ruined so they couldn't use it and mounting the wolves wasn't an viable option so he frees them. Arthur found some clothes for the girl and he gives it to her and together they start walking the direction she marked. They got to know each other more while walking. Her name was Tesha Iralif, a smiling, curious, kind, but above all a crybaby girl. During all night Arthur tells her to go to sleep while he keeps watching but he really wanted a minute alone to find out the will thing Sylvia talked about. But the child wanted him to sleep with her. She said that she would never share bed with a boy but she promises not to say anything. Arthur tell her not to worry, that he was okay but she insists, that the beasts would be attracted by a kid alone. She says that it was for his own safety but the truth is that she was scared. And now that he was there she could finally get some rest. They went their way for a few days and even though going back to his family was something that worried him. What bothered Arthur the most during his journey were the strong and sudden pains going through his mana core. But he tried to hide them from Tesha so she wouldn't worry. They would sleep together, walk together, hunt together, even though she didn't want to. But little by little the elf seemed to know more and more the place. They were near but their journey kept being delayed because his body couldn't hold up the constant rhythm. Tesha mustered the courage and finally asked Arthur that after all they've been through, now she could call her art as his family did. Arthur says yes, that there was no problem but she was disappointed because he accepted just like that as if it was nothing. So just to bother her, Arthur changes his answer and says that it would be an honor if Tesha Ralith would call this humble peasant as art. Although their mental age different, both of them had become close, and at last after a long travel they arrived. Arthur could only see trees and bushes and a lot of tall grass, but Tesha starts touching some trees and a magic entrance appears. They entered the portal and suddenly they arrived to this incredible place. A bunch of kneeled men appear immediately. They had come to welcome the princess. Arthur couldn't believe what he heard, but the king and queen Elenoir appear and they were so relieved because their daughter had finally appeared. And with them there was Viriam Iralith, a man present in every history book. The old king of Elenoir who lead the last war against humans from Sapin Kingdom. Arthur gives a little push to Tesha and gets happy for this touching reunion. The king thanks him for helping them and he invites him to a feast as a sign of gratitude. His words were kind but his eyes showed that it was an order and not an offer. Arthur accepts and everyone gets surprised when Tesha holds his hand and with a big smile she says that she has so many things to show him. When he knew that she was a princess he thought that she'd live in a big castle. But the truth was so much more than he thought. The queen asks her servants to make their guest comfortable but Arthur refuses. First of all he wanted to explain what happened so they could take him seriously, and not just like a child. He politely introduces himself and then he proceeds to explain everything. 
even though he doesn't tell all the truth. He tells that he was with his family and they had to go separated because of some bandits. The king got furious when he knows that some slave traders were guilty of all that. It was about some miserable humans. I should have known he says. But Arthur says that trafficking is a way of life not a whole race. The soldiers get their weapons ready but the old king stops them and now he asks. How is it possible that a kid could rescue her? Did he negotiate with them? Did he ask for mercy? But Arthur says no. Even though he is just a kid he also is a magician. So he got rid of them and rescued her. One of the soldiers gets angry for hearing those lies but the old king puts him in his place with just a stare. Arthur says that he doesn't care if they believe him or not. The princess was safe and sound and now the only thing he wanted is to go back to his family. Tesha didn't want him to go but Arthur explains that because of the history between their kingdoms, a human should not stay for long, and his priority was to know if his family was okay. The king says that it doesn't matter what happened in the past. The truth is that he rescued her daughter and he even bothered to get her there, so he deserved a reward. But unfortunately the portal that leads to the human kingdom can be used once every seven years during the Three Races Summit, and it was still five years out until reopens. Yet they had no trouble sending a group of guards to escort him home safe and sound. He would have his escort ready for tomorrow so for now he asked him to get comfortable and rest. So Arthur goes and take a pleasant shower, but everything goes wrong again when those pains got back. Tessa also appears in his room and she greets him with a header. He had treated her family so coldly and also he was leaving so soon. She didn't want him to go. He is her first friend and she was about to cry but Arthur cheers her up and asks her to show him the castle. Tesha takes him to her favorite place. It was beautiful. But suddenly a knife is thrown to the princess. Arthur catches it in the air, realized where the attack came from and uses the knife against him. It was Tesha's grandfather. Arthur asks why the hell did he want to kill his own granddaughter. But later he realizes that it was a fake knife. He was only testing him. His use of mana was mediocre but he had good senses and reflexes. Now the grandfather could see how he managed to defeat those slave traders. Tesha asks her grandpa not to bother him but Mr. Virium says that it's been a long time since he knew someone interesting. So he gave the boy a wooden sword and asked him to show him what he has got. Arthur immediately swing his sword into his neck but he just managed to hit a residual image. Even with that, this little boy was frightening. Arthur rushes again but he manages to strike another residual image. The grandpa gets behind him and hit him on the back. Arthur manages to protect himself and gets out just in time to avoid another attack. He is hit in the air with a poke. Art goes flying but he grabs his sword again and he uses fire magic again. See get close but Virium takes his sword out again. It was his chance. The old man attacks and Arthur takes advantage to get over him. Then he twists amazingly in the air and though the attack want powerful he manages to hit him. The grandpa couldn't believe that he actually hit him. That happened for being arrogant. He wanted a second round but Tesha says that he already intimidated him enough. She also says that he should be a little softer but the old man says that that if otherwise. The intimidated one would have been him. Arthur feels flattered by his thoughts and now the grandpa asks him to become his disciple. Arthur is shocked by that petition but he says that it could not be possible. Can't a human live in the elf kingdom? Virinium says that while under his arm, nobody would dare to kick him out. He should be aware that he was better than many other kids, even adults, but he need to understand that he could teach him things that not even the best human magicians could. Even with that Arthur refuses. The only thing he wanted was to be reunited with his family and let them know that he was fine. But then Virium proposes something. If there was a way to communicate with them and make them know that he was okay, would he accept? Arthur didn't get the chance to answer when the grandpa sends his granddaughter to sleep and he confesses that he felt something during their combat. He asks him if his mana core has been in pain. Pains that grow stronger and frequently. Arthur could explain himself how he knew this. The old man says that it is more important that fact that he wasn't aware about why he had those pains. The grandpa explains that what a beast will is. Beasts are classified by their strength and class of beasts or superior get the ability to transmit their will whether to his descendants or someone bond to them. He wouldn't ask him how he got that powerful will but at that point what he got inside was hurting him. The reason why Virium knew all this is because he also had a will. And that's what it's called a beast tamer. A title obtained when you finally conquer the beast within you. He knew that to be reunited with his family was important but it was paramount to learn how to control his power. Otherwise it would end up destroying him from the inside. The next day he is woken up early by Tesha, who was very excited because his grandfather told her that he would stay. Although everything depends on what happens today. Kings told the grandpa that it wasn't a good idea, that keeping a human in their kingdom as a disciple wouldn't be well seen. But Mr. Virium says that he doesn't care. He liked the boy and even her daughter agreed with that. So he would be under his protection and guidance and lastly he says that everyone in the kingdom should know about it. Arthur is happy about that. The old man really is liable and on their way. He starts calling him grandpa. It seems that he gained his trust quickly and when he sees the way that he treats his granddaughter. Mr. Virium thanks him. Tesha grew up very lonely as the only queen. 
During her whole life she was hurt many times by people and other children who pretended to be her friends. And in these few days he had seen her smile more than in her whole life. So that's why he was thankful. They finally arrives to the place. Miriam shouts and kicks the door to make an old lady go out and he introduces her to him. It was about an old friend, Rinia Darkassen, a very special diverter that might help him. The lady was a divine. Her magic allowed her to snoop into Arthur's mind. There was so little he could hide from her. Although this kid was special because there was something about his past that even her couldn't see. But they weren't there for that. They were there to speak with his parents. So she puts him in front of a water bucket and she made him think about them as clear as possible. When Arthur fell, his parents couldn't hold him. They both exploded into tears. Reynolds had to be punched to get him back to his senses and Alice almost suicide. At the end, they managed to get to Zyrus. They arrived to a pretty house that it might be Reynolds' friend's house. It also seems that Reynolds got a good job and together they managed to face the pain of his lost. They were melancholic and sad, but they both supported themselves to keep up. Until now when they just hear his son's voice inside their heads. Arthur explain everything that happened. That he survived. That he arrived the elves' kingdom. That he was sick but he must be treated and that's why he must stay for a few years. But the important thing is that he was alive and soon they would get be together. His parents' grey days were over. Their son is alive. Art was alive. Three years went by that way. At that time, Tesha experienced her core's awakening. She has now turned nine, and Arthur is about to reach a new phase in his training. But suddenly, he emits a lot of mana, setting off an explosion and ending up unconscious. So he then had to explain to Virian that it was a dragon who gave him his will, learning thereby that dragons are uncommon beasts, and the most powerful ones. But that wasn't the only news that he received. In four months, he'll be able to go home, and if that wasn't enough, the object belonging to Sylvia that he had left behind breaks. Carefully, Arthur gets close in order to see what has happened. Suddenly, a small eye is seen through a gap in the egg. Arthur never imagined that it was an egg. After breaking entirely, a small dark dragon comes out and bites Arthur. But instead of being left with a bite, a small symbol appears. Suddenly, he starts to hear a voice inside his head. It's the small dragon. Still confused about what is happening, he decides to call her Sylvie in her mother's memory. Arthur falls into a deep sleep. Suddenly, a shout wakes him up. It's Tesha. While they go to continue their training, the old Virian is left startled. He then tells him that beings like Sylvie only hatch in front of their family members, and he warns him that when he returns home, he must keep her safe. Then, they continue on to the final stage of their training. These tamers are able to use a beast's unique mana skills. This has two stages. The first stage, the acquisition stage, is that in which a wizard is able to use the beast's strength. But the second stage is that in which a wizard is able to use the beast's true skill. Virian, after years of training, was able to unblock the Shadow Panther's second stage. In that way, he proceeds to give him a display of his power, showing incredible speed while fully concealing his presence and showing a brutal thirst for blood. Days went by that way, and with Virian's help, he was able to attain the first phase. He also taught him how to conceal his beast's will presence from other wizards. In that way, the days went by, enjoying their final days in Elenoir, until the day of their departure arrived. Tesha couldn't hide her tears, and she received a special present from the former king. In that way, along with a small group of elves, they arrived at the floating city of Zyrus. Arthur is before a large door. For three long years, he lived through many adventures. He lost many companions that he never imagined he would find, and he will finally be able to see his parents again. When they open the door, a maid greets him, and behind her, a small girl, suddenly a woman, approaches him. It's his mother. Suddenly, his father appears from behind, and they all blend into a great embrace. He then tells them about everything he lived. He gives them a vague explanation of how he survived the fall, and the reason why he had to stay at a Lenoir, all without mentioning the great dragon, and telling them that the small animal that he has next to him is a simple mana beast. Feeling a little bad about that, he then greets the little girl, Elena, his sister. Time may pass, but people don't change. His father boasts in front of him that he is reaching a new phase in his mana circle. But he's left stunned when Arthur tells him that he's very close to catching up to him, so he challenges him to a duel to see how much he has advanced. At that point, the house's owners, who are his parents' friends, also arrive, Vincent and Tabita. With them is their daughter, Lilia. They all go out to the garden. There, both of them get ready. The first attacks were meant to test each other without using magic, although his father admits that he took him by surprise. But from now on, he will get serious about it. His father, who did not have a good training, took years to get where he is now and be finally able to turn his mana to fire, developing thereby explosive fists. On the other hand, Arthur had many advantages from the time he was born into this new world. 
This culminated in his total control of all four elements, mastering some up to their deviation level. Arthur uses lightning magic, and he starts to attack at an amazing speed, which is impossible to match for his father. Both land a blow, which creates an explosion, but his father manages to catch up with him. But just as it all began, it all ended immediately. And as may have been expected, everyone was left stunned by the young eight-year-old boy's skills. Vincent is still in disbelief at what he has just seen, but he tries to persuade Reynolds to enroll Arthur in the Zyrus Academy. He will love to pay for his studies. However, Arthur, in a serious manner, asks them to let him spend more time with his family before deciding if he wants to go. The following day, they go shopping. On the way, he finds out that the Helstia family owns the most important auction house of the city, and his father has become its head of security, but he also was given a small change. However, not all is peace and quiet. There are eyes observing them. Only the most talented wizards can attend the Zyrus Academy. Great scholars, royal leaders and militaries come out of this institution. It's unmatched by any other magic academy on the continent, and Headmaster Goodski is at its head. Thanks to Vincent's connections with the academy, he persuaded the headmaster to evaluate Arthur personally, without mentioning his abilities to her. So they go out to the house's garden, where they start the test. While he was entering with Virian, his previous world's martial arts were manifested as elements in this new world. They only had to adapt a little bit. Arthur throws some loops at Goodski, but she uses wind magic to return his own attack, so Arthur heads towards her using wind magic. But when he thinks he has crossed her defense, he is expelled violently. When he stops and he starts to do another attack, Goodski creates some small tornadoes. She is impressed when she sees that Arthur goes through all of them. But the test doesn't end. After a warning, she triggers some sound magic to leave him unconscious. But that doesn't happen, after which she considers the test finished. But surprises do not end for Goodski. When she realizes that Arthur has an affinity with all four elements, she loses her balance a little bit, and she says that he could be the strongest wizard in the future. But something unsettles Arthur, and she notices, so she creates a small field where nobody can enter and no sound can leave. Arthur tells her that he showed her his abilities because he wants something from her. He wants her to protect his family until he has the power to do so. Goodski is left a little impressed, since not even the very king would be able to make a deal with her. But the time for that hasn't arrived yet. Arthur first wants to become an adventurer, although his mother doesn't agree and his father tries to take her side. Anything that he says is in vain. Arthur tries to persuade them by telling them that he could go with a companion. After emotions have calmed down, Reynolds tells him that in two months, the twin horns will come visit, so he'll be able to start his journey with one of them. Later that same day, Arthur goes to Vincent's office, and he asks him for some items to be able to go on his journey in exchange for helping his daughter Lilia with her mana's awakening. Vincent and his wife aren't wizards, and Vincent hopes that his daughter may be able to become one, although the chances are very low. As was to be expected, not everyone took it well, since there isn't such a thing as speeding a wizard's awakening. Despite everything, he wants to try it. After explaining to them for a while what he did as a child, they proceed with it, although the awakening won't happen soon, and it can take years. In that way, Arthur spends his time training and then helping the girls. Two months go by that way until the twin horns arrive. Everyone felt remorse about not being able to do anything to prevent him from falling, and they thought he was dead. But now everyone is ready since something important is about to happen. It is the Helstia Auction House's anniversary where there are highly valuable objects. The twin horns have come for that reason, to help with security. Arriving, Arthur is fascinated. Not even in his past life did he see something similar. But that's not the only surprise he'll have that day. King Blaine Glaner of Sapin and his entire family arrive there since they are business associates with Vincent. The king is interested in Sylvie, but he's not the only one. Someone who is accompanying the king asks Arthur excitedly to teach him more about the small mana beast that he has, but the king stops them. The great auction starts. In it, great valuable items of great power are seen, even some class of mana beast cores. The king himself bids on some objects. Vincent tells Arthur that if anything interests him, he can ask for it. After a while, Arthur notices Sylvie's absence, and he starts to search for her. But the royal family's wizard is about to catch her. Arthur manages to get her to escape, but at that moment, the man threatens him telling him that Sylvie will be his. Arthur lets a great pressure and a brutal thirst for blood out, which leaves everyone startled, leaving the royal wizard on the floor. But fortunately, no one knows who did it. Coincidentally, they captured a thief who is blamed for it, but everything is far from finished. The wizard whispers something to the king, who calls Arthur's father to tell him that he wants to be given Arthur's mana beast in order to gift it to his personal wizard. Far from accepting the king's order, Reynold avoids the order by saying that neither he nor his wife have anything to do with his son's link, since he got it on his own. 
The king looks towards Arthur, who looks at him menacingly. He proposes a deal, if he gives him his beast, he will let him choose a sword from his armory. But Arthur declines the offer politely. Far from done, the king offers him an exchange. The mana beast that he just bought in exchange for Sylvie, but Arthur, in a serious manner, rejects the offer again. The king, without patience, asks him a direct question. But Arthur replies with a different question, which leaves everyone stunned. The royal guards attack Arthur, but he beats them with a single blow. The royal wizard tries to cast a spell very close to him. Arthur activates a technique that allows him to split from the flow of time, and he enters the Beast Will's first phase. With a murderous and menacing look, he throws an attack that breaks one of his legs. He tries to ask for help, but nobody can hear him. But everything ended too fast. The king, who was able to see Arthur's first attack, is in disbelief. Then, Lilia's screaming invades the scene. Everyone is left in shock when they see the royal wizard's state, while Arthur is on the floor. Eight hours went by before he woke up. A representative of the king's is waiting for him. He offered him some gold coins for them to forget what happened. He then receives an explanation. The soldiers themselves interrupted the wizard's attack, which made his leg break. In that way, the incident never took place. On the next day, they decide who will accompany Arthur on his adventurer journey. It will be Jasmine. Only one thing is left to do, find a proper sword for him. Thus, they head again to the auction house, where the Helstia were waiting for him. After spending hours looking for something suitable for him, his hopes were lost. But Sylvie finds something, a sword that it was impossible for her to unsheathe. She tried all sorts of magic, but it was impossible for her. Suddenly, she got an idea, so she went into the first beast tamer phase, and she finally unsheathed the sword. On the next day, it is Arthur's birthday. There is time to laugh and cry. They have a good time, and it will be the last one for a long while. When he became king in his past life, he was alone. He lost his family, and he had to fight alone in that world. But now he has a family, and he must become stronger for them, to be able to protect them. He then receives some gifts that will be of great use to him in the future, until the day of his departure arrives. It was hard for everyone to let him go. He spent three months with them, and that doesn't make up for the three years that he was away. But despite everything, they wish him luck in his new adventure. Together with Jasmine, they arrive at the Adventurer's Guild, and she sponsors him so that he only has to do the final test. Once inside, they meet with the institution's head. But for some reason, his presence bothers Jasmine, and even more when he mentions her family. Arthur introduces himself as Note. Since this is his new adventure, he doesn't want them to know his true identity. On the testing ground, the examiners determine the new adventurer's classifications through short duels. Here, two fellows draw Arthur's attention, Elijah, who didn't have to do the test, and was classified as a Class B adventurer, and Lucas, who had an arrogant attitude. Even after ending the test, he tried to attack the examiner, but he was stopped, being placed in the B class. Now it's Arthur's turn, but when they are about to start, they are stopped by Caspian, who is a AA adventurer. He will examine Arthur personally. Caspian wasn't showing any openings or any bloodthirst pressure. For some reason, Arthur was excited. They start with some very fast attacks. Soon, Arthur realizes that he's at a disadvantage in his first real fight only with swords. He's much smaller than when he had his first fight in his previous world, and his muscles aren't well developed enough to fight a veteran with his mana reinforced body. Caspian decides to get serious, and he triggers his wind magic and starts to shoot wind bullets. Arthur felt how his body told him to go out running, but after getting used to his attacks, he decides to get close and counter-attack with fire magic. The battle becomes more intense each time, and it has stopped being a test. Soon, Caspian starts feeling nervous, and he starts intensifying his attacks. He creates a wind gust, increasing his bullet's speed. But Arthur doesn't lag behind. When Caspian thought he was going to lose, he unleashes a lot of mana and wind gusts. But when Arthur was getting ready to use his other skills, Caspian decides to stop. He tells him that he understands why he didn't show all his skills. He wants a low classification to go unnoticed. They give him a B class. As was to be expected, everyone is stunned by what has happened, but more so Caspian, who is frustrated. But the most stunned are the examiners, who don't know why there are so many adventurers with high scores. Caspian then reveals that the king lifted the ban that was preventing dwarves and elves from becoming adventurers, and the reason is that the continent is entering a new age. On the other hand, we see how Tesha observes Arthur with an orb, and she's jealous about his approach to Lilia. But her grandfather comes in to deliver some news. She'll be able to attend the Zyrus Academy with Arthur, due to negotiations between the three kingdoms to integrate a new generation of wizards into the Zyrus Academy. But that's something we'll get back to later on. Arthur, after receiving his adventurer's license, heads towards the beast clearing for his first mission. 
There, Sylvie must go her own way, so they decide to part for some time to develop their skills. While they were resting, Arthur asks Jasmine why she decided to become an adventurer. She tells him that she decided to flee from her family. The Flamesworth family has created many of the most powerful wizards with a fire affinity on the continent, since fire is the most powerful element but she was considered inferior for having a wind affinity. This reminded Arthur how in his past life, his Kai was lower than normal. Jasmine then confesses that when she's talking to him, she doesn't feel that she's talking to a child. The next day, Jasmine tells him that she took him there to be able to train him. After his combat with Caspian, she saw his flaws. His movements are precise in his head, but his body doesn't answer him. Arthur, since he arrived in that new world, realized that his body wouldn't react to his sword skills, his greatest virtue, and that is because his body is too small. While he was fighting with Jasmine, he confirmed his flaws. Since he discovered magic, he has depended too much on it, sidelining his sword skills. Therefore, he stops using magic for two years to recover his swordsmanship level. Two years later, there are rumors among adventurers about a small swordsman who cleared a dungeon by himself and who ascended to class adventurer using only his sword. But for others, it's hard to believe, or they are all false stories to them. Suddenly, the bar's door is opened, and Arthur comes in. A large-sized adventurer approaches him to challenge him, but he simply ignores him. Suddenly, he attacks him from behind, but Arthur is intact. Thinking that he missed, he starts a series of attacks, but none touch him. Then, a cry of despair is heard. Arthur cuts his fingers and exerts pressure on the place, filling everyone present with fear. He then leaves, reinforcing the rumors about the masked swordsman. Two years went by after that, since Arthur started his adventurer phase. During that time, he spent time in many dungeons, and he improved his swordsmanship. But Lilia also had her mana awakening. She would regularly return home, but she's about to go on her last mission before starting her lessons at the Zyrus Academy. She joins a group of adventurers in which we may see some familiar faces. Arthur is not happy at all about seeing Lucas again, but he is a little happy about seeing Elijah. They are all led by Brald, a Class A adventurer. They enter the dungeon. Inside, they spend some minutes walking without finding any beasts, but a sound makes them look up. They are attacked by Batrunners. While they are defending themselves, Brawl orders them to conserve their energy and not use magic. But as was to be expected, the only one who didn't listen was Lucas, who creates a fire typhoon that eliminates all the beasts. Brawl was upset due to Lucas' disobedience, since he knows how dangerous that dungeon can become the deeper they go in. They reach a place with many gaps, but without time to think, a giant worm appears in front of them. Creo creates some water barrier, but the beast disappears in an instant. Oliver, a wizard who is with them, wants to keep going by himself to impress one of the girls. But Arthur notes something. He quickly orders Lucas to create a fire barrier. But when he's about to save Oliver, a large explosion entirely engulfs him. Not having time to mourn their loss, they decide to move forward fast. But the enormous beast appears again. They all attack together. But when they were about to kill it, the beast fled. However, this is not over yet. The ground quakes and there is a big eruption, filling the entire place with fire. Some were able to protect themselves, but they have all come out unharmed, or that's what they think. Brald has lost an arm. After stopping the bleeding, Lucas confronts him and they have an argument. But Arthur, tired of his attitude, tells him that he's just a burden for not reacting in time. Then, everyone makes a choice, and they name Arthur the new leader. While they keep moving forward, they come across a blocked entry. After some tries, they manage to take it down, finding something very different from the rest of the place. It was full of flowers and plants. Arthur is very restless, and he feels that something is wrong with this place. As expected, Jasmine starts having visions and Creole comes out running shouting his dead wife's name. They create a barrier, and then Arthur orders an attack to dispel the fog, revealing a completely different environment. Lucas starts an attack to burn everything, but the ivies are intact. Swordsmen launch a joint attack to cut everything, but that's also futile. Everything grows again very quickly. Brawl loses his sanity for a moment, and he starts attacking without control, but he's trapped by the plants. However, he's saved and stopped by Arthur. Every kind of attack seemed to be useless. Arthur turns towards the group to give them new orders, but they are all horrified in front of an enormous beast that can't be compared to the previous one. They are all in shock. The beast in front of them is an ancestral guardian, a class S mana beast. It has Creole inside itself. That makes Reginald lose control, and, fashioning a rock armor for himself, he dashes into a suicide attack, managing to cut off one arm from the beast. But instead of improving, everything becomes worse. The beast starts attacking everyone. Reginald is captured, and when they're trying to take stock and escape, Arthur receives a direct attack from Lucas, who is willing to do whatever it takes to save himself. Jasmine goes to help him, but she also receives an attack. His plan is to make the beast attack them to be able to escape and he accomplishes his goal. The beast is about to attack Elijah, but he's saved by Brald, 
who again, in a fit of madness and fear, dashes on his own to attack the enormous being. Any damage that he inflicts on it is healed in an instant. Now the beast is even more furious. Arthur asks if it may be a good idea to use his secret weapon, but in his current state, that could cause him to die. With no other options, he decides to enter the second beast tamer phase. Some yellow marks appear throughout his body and his hair turns white. With a strength that intimidates the beast itself, Arthur starts to attack it. In that state, Arthur can use all of his environment's mana and each of his attacks inflicts great damage on the mana beast. The battle turns wilder, but it's time to put an end to it. Arthur freezes the beast with his left hand, and in his right hand, he creates some black beams that destroy the beast completely. But he had to pay a high price. He's left half dead, having lost a lot of blood. With no strength left, he goes unconscious. When he wakes up, Elijah was the one who had saved him, and Jasmine is by his side, also unconscious. The damage that both have suffered is evident. A day went by since that incident. With the little strength he has to speak, he asks him to break some crystals that he has in his glove, which contain his mother's healing magic. He repeats the same with Jasmine, but he still doesn't have the strength to get up. Knowing that they can't leave that place for a while, they introduce each other formally again. Elijah comes from Drav, the dwarves' kingdom. But he's not a dwarf. He doesn't know who his parents are or where he came from. An old man raised him. He lived a normal life until he entered his mana circle's dark orange phase and he triggered his deviant metal creating magic. The old man who raised him told him that it was time to explore the rest of the continent. He is stunned when Arthur tells him that he has an affinity with four elements and two deviations, and even more when he tells him that he's a beast tamer. When Jasmine wakes up, she apologizes to Arthur because she wasn't able to save him a second time. But it's time to get out of there. The damage done by the battles is enormous and nobody else survived. Or that's what they think. Elijah uses an earth pulsation and finds someone. It's Samantha who is gravely wounded. They suddenly hear a thunder and another beast appears, but this one is Sylvie. She has grown a lot since the last time Arthur saw her. She was in touch with him through their mental link. Although Arthur told her not to come, she came to help them. Her presence intimidates all the beasts and they aren't attacked by any. But Samantha wakes up. Speaking with a lot of effort, she gives him her mask and a Class S Beast Mana Core. Arthur suggests selling it and splitting the profit equally, but nobody agrees because he defeated the Great Beast on his own. Without being able to go further due to Samantha's state, Elijah and Jasmine go to the Adventurer's Guild to ask for help. They're all safe. They were able to retrieve Browd's body, but only his. In front of an old acquaintance, the three give their statement on what they had to go through. But suddenly, Lucas comes in. Jasmine and Elijah get ready to attack him, but Arthur stops them. Taking advantage of the situation, Lucas tries to blame them for everything. But Arthur throws his sword at him, cutting his ear. Suddenly, the pressure grows heavier. Arthur heads towards him to finish him off. Lucas' guardians go on the attack, but they are quickly defeated one by one, and when he is about to attack Lucas, Bladeheart shouts at him to stop, saying, I'm sorry, my sword slipped and I wanted it back. Arthur stops. Everyone who is present retreats and only the supervisor and Arthur are left to have a small chat. He advises him not to try to kill Lucas. The Wykes family, to which he belongs, won't stand idly by if something happens to him. Even if they don't know who he is, they will kill everyone close to him, like Jasmine or the Horn Twins, the current members and the former ones. He also gives him a last warning. He must be more careful with Lucas' half-brother, who is one of the most powerful wizards. Minutes later, they conduct a trial on what happened. Lucas is only deprived of his adventurer's license. All of this is due to his family's influence. But Arthur is barred from coming close to Cyrus while Lucas attends the academy, but without having to reveal his identity. Clearly, this angers Lucas because he wanted to know his identity. But all that is arranged, since Arthur asked Bladeheart not to reveal anything about him. As a last offer of help, they made him retreat through a secret door. They were waiting for him on the other side. That way, they all go home, but there's a problem. Elijah doesn't have anywhere to go, so Arthur offers to come with him to then enter the Zyrus Academy together, but he refuses at the beginning because he has neither the money nor the contacts to enter. Arthur tells him that he'll take care of that. He then asks them to go ahead, since he has something to do. Bladeheart wants to speak to him. Arthur thanks him for having made the judge help him, and he gives him a farewell gift. He throws a bag filled with gold coins at him so that he'll be able to take precautions. With this, he buys a dimensional ring to hide the sword and the beast's core. He spent two years adventuring, and he was about to die in the last mission. But it's time to go back to a normal life. When night falls, he finally gets home. His sister was waiting for him. His parents also come out to greet him. His mother was worried about him. Thanks to a ring which they both have, she knew that he was about to die. They all gather in the living room and the most excited one is his father who wants him to tell him about the dungeon. Elijah and Arthur tell him about everything they went through. Their astonished faces were to be expected, but they still can't believe that he alone defeated a Class S beast. 
Arthur gives his father the Mana Beast score so that he can absorb the remaining mana, since he wasn't able to make progress purifying his nucleus, no matter how hard he tried. As noted, his days have passed, so he decides to put away his mask, so as not to use it again. Next day, his father gives him the Mana Core back. But there's something weird when the mana is completely extracted. The core is delayed, but it's intact, so Arthur decides to find out what's happening. Inside the core is the Class S Beast, so he tries his luck and he tries to obtain the beast's will. But Sylvie's will prevents him from doing it, and before destroying the other beast, he drops the core. He then thinks about whom he might give it to. Days go by, and Arthur trains with Elijah and he also spends time with his family. But something is about to happen. The King of Sapin will deliver some important news. While they are heading towards the city center, Arthur and Vincent take different paths. Thanks to Vincent's connections, they manage to see Gideon, the most important artisan on the continent. His knowledge is quite above that of all others, and Arthur heard that there's something he cannot do, make a ship that can sail long distances. So he decides to use his knowledge from his previous life, and he creates the blueprints for a steamboat. In this world everything depends on magic, which has delayed its scientific progress. But there's something weird. For that reason, he decided not to include any fundamental parts in his blueprint, in order to learn why they suddenly want to create ships to sail large distances. Gideon offers a great amount of treasures for him to hand over the blueprints, and to draw his attention. They contain the core of two worm phoenixes, and a class S beast. Therefore, he decides to take them. But that won't be enough to persuade him, so Gideon decides to reveal the truth to him. There is proof that there is a continent beyond Dickatham. A few years back, purely by luck, an adventurer shot down an artifact that was joined to a mana beast that was capable of camouflaging. Gideon, after a year of research, discovered that the artifact is capable of filming and storing images, so they concluded that someone's been observing them for some time, which is not good news. After leaving the entire blueprints with him, they head towards the city center together with Elijah. On their way, they come across a group of young men beating another one just for being from the Drav Kingdom. Elijah decides to stop them, but they are all forbidden from using magic outside the academy, so he also starts receiving damage. This clearly angers Arthur, and he easily defeats them without having to use magic. This is so until one of them decides to use magic, but everything freezes. The Sapin princes Cathile and Curtis stop the fight. In order to justify their acts, they lie to the princes, who want to reproach Arthur, but he won't stay silent. Vincent explains what happened, and everything gets complicated when the main attacker tells him that he comes from the Trident family, one of the biggest donors to the royal family and the Zyrus Academy, which forces the prince to let everything slip as if nothing had happened. But for Arthur that doesn't end here. He immediately contacts Headmaster Goodski, and he asks her to expel all the attackers from the academy if she wants him to attend until they reach the center. There are the kings from the three kingdoms. They state that during the past years, they have been in constant meetings to be able to unite the three races, and gradually, they have been able to become unified, until they get to the important part. When they state that there is another continent, people's restlessness shows immediately. There are doubts about whether they come with good or bad intentions. In order to calm down and make people feel safe, he introduces those who will be the six protecting lances of the continent and the six most powerful wizards of the three kingdoms. But hearing the name of the last one, Elijah and Arthur feel uncomfortable. It's Luca's half-brother. They had warned him that he's a powerful wizard, but not that he's one of the continent's most powerful wizards. Four months have gone by since the new continent's announcement. During that time, Gideon and Arthur stayed in touch. So much so that Gideon gives him a gift so that he can hide two of his four elements. But it's more important that the great ship is about to set sail. But that's not the only news, since Arthur will start his studies at the Zyrus Academy. After a few weeks, it's the first day of class. But Arthur isn't even awake. Elijah tries to wake him up, but he's attacked by Sylvie, who also wants to stay asleep. After saying goodbye to his family, they arrive at the academy. They meet a large number of students at the entrance, several of them accompanied by mana beasts, and they all enter a large building with gold and shiny decorations. They complete a last identity registration there where they have to declare their elemental affinities. The records officer is surprised upon learning that Arthur has two affinities. Next, they move on to an enormous conference hall where headmistress Cynthia appears, who silences the entire place with an incredible display of sound magic. After giving a brief speech and announcing her excitement about having more students from the other races, she gives the floor to the student council leader. They are all charmed by her beauty. Sylvie jumps happily when she realizes who it is, but Arthur gives a slight smile. After four years, he sees his old friend again, Tesha Iralif, who also delivers a small speech in order to try to settle issues about discrimination among races and among battle and scholar wizards. Later on, while they were heading towards their rooms, they witnessed some acts of that nature, a human treating a dwarf with contempt, forcing him to start a duel. 
The power difference is evident, and after a series of attacks, the human prevails. But that's not enough for him, and he tries to break his hand. Elijah tries to help, but Arthur gets ahead, saying mockingly that the council president is coming this way, something which the other student takes badly. Arthur's plan was to enter the academy without drawing attention to himself, but Sylvie doesn't help with that, since she spits on the student, who prepares to attack. But the situation is brought to a halt by Tesha's arrival. Lilia also was there, and she's also a council member. However, the situation didn't completely calm down, so Tesha is forced to rebuke the student, emphasizing that he could be expelled. But she also rebukes Arthur for causing problems on his first day. However, he doesn't take it well, so he decides to leave. At that moment, Clive, another council member not happy with Arthur's attitude toward Tesha, decides to rebuke him, but he's immediately dismissed. Later that night, while he was in his room, they receive a visit by headmistress Cynthia. Upon noticing this, Elijah decides to leave so they can talk in private. The first thing that she notices about Arthur is that he's hiding two of his elements. He explains why. Lucas Wikes is also attending the academy, and he doesn't want to raise any suspicions in him about his identity. But he also uses the opportunity to ask her a few things, among them, asking for access to classes for advanced wizards with deviations. But they're interrupted by Elijah, who reproaches Arthur for the way he he's talking to Goodski. It was futile, however, since she tells him that she was plotting something. If he wants to have unlimited access to all that, he will have to be part of the disciplinary committee, a group made up of the strongest wizards in the academy who are in charge of keeping order and enforcing norms. Not having a choice, Arthur accepts, so he is given the uniform, which makes him suspect that she already had planned for him to accept the terms. Before leaving, she tells him to fix things with Tesha. Elijah, who can't stand Arthur anymore, calls him the Princess Charmer. The night isn't over yet, and they head to the dining hall, where sights don't go unnoticed. While they were eating, a group of students approach them, who invite Elijah to join their group. But both he and Elijah make fun of them for their name and attitude. When they try to attack him, their attack is repelled. Thinking that it was all luck, his assailant attacks again but he's tied up by a deviant magic user's binds, and only Arthur knows who it was. Without having to touch a single hair of his, he humiliates the student pulling by his trousers down in front of everyone, and he decides to go out for a bit. There, he finds Tesha, who thanks him for helping her. But they then have an awkward silence. Not knowing what else to say, he apologizes for what happened during the day, but she apologizes too. Doing this, she strikes him accidentally and she leans on his shoulder. After talking about what happened, Elijah shows up, who looks at him weirdly, so he asks Tesha to go on a walk with him. On the way, he tells her about everything that he lived as an adventurer those past two years, and also about the incident with Lucas. On her part, she is jealous about Jasmine, who was with him that time, and she notes that everything in him has changed. He then gives her the core of the class S beast that he beat, so that she can be a beast tamer, and they say goodbye. Next morning, he heads to the hall in his new uniform to meet the other discipline committee members. Opening the door, an enormous lion roars in front of him but Arthur doesn't even flinch. Behind the beast was Kai Cressleys, a fourth year who looks curiously at Arthur. His plan was to frighten him with the world lion's help. They greet each other. Next to them is Dorodria, a first year. They are both on the discipline committee. Wasting no more time, they head to the room where the other members are. Going inside, there is someone familiar, Prince Curtis, whom Arthur already imagined would be the last member. Arthur thinks and he concludes that the lion they have there is the beast which the king bought some years back at the auction where they first met. Going down the stairs comes Princess Kathleen, who greets him with a subtle smile. On the other side comes another acquaintance, Faerith, the elf that he met while he was at a Lenoir. Arthur mocks him for a while, reminding him of the small fight they had years ago. Suddenly, the last two members appear, Claire Bladeheart and Theo. The latter decides to test his strength, and he offers to shake his hand. At that instant, he uses gravitational magic to pull him to the ground, or at least that was his intention, for Arthur is still standing, which leaves everyone stunned, and leaving everything to the side, they exit towards the conference hall, where they are introduced as official members of the discipline committee. Later, that same morning, Arthur has his first class, nothing that he hasn't studied before, the difference between augmenting wizards and conjurers, although the entire class was debate-centered. He then heads towards his next class. The room looks like a small coliseum, and while he was lost in his thoughts, to his side Kathleen asks for permission to sit next to him, although there are many available seats. But she's not the only one. Faerith also sits next to him. At that moment, the professor in charge of the class comes in. 
Curiously, this is someone that Arthur also knows. The professor also recognizes him and decides to humiliate him with the excuse of testing the disciplinary committee members. While Arthur thinks that only an idiot would bite that bait, Fay raises his hand and he volunteers. In front of the teacher, he triggers a shield that surrounds both of them to prevent others from taking damage, and they begin. Fay triggers a flooding domain, a spell that gives him an advantage, and in that way, he casts spells with greater ease. So he decides to build up all his power and shoot an enormous water serpent. But the teacher is not just talk, and he summons a blue fireball that evaporates the water spell and harms Faye's leg, forcing him to give up. He then looks directly at Arthur. The next one to volunteer is Kathleen. She triggers some ice spears, and the professor evaporates them. After a second attack, she breaks the ice spears to make smaller projectiles. But at that moment, he shoots a firestorm over the princess. She made another attack and forgot her defense, which forces Arthur to intervene. He rebukes the professor for playing games, and he decides to take Kathleen's spot. He makes the professor do this under his terms, which makes him even angrier. After saying that he will go calmly after him, he launches into the attack full strength. Arthur notices this. After a series of attacks, he merely augments his body to dodge all the attacks, and the demonstration becomes a battle between them. The professor intensifies his attacks, but Arthur doesn't flinch, and he decides to put an end to this in front of the student's astonished looks. The power differential is evident. After cornering him, he ends the battle with a storm of wind shockwaves. After everything has ended, there is only one thing that bothers him. He knows that it took him too long to defeat someone who was only using wind magic. His next class is that of Spell Fundamentals, where he meets Emily, a shy girl. But he soon discovers that it's she who invented the projection artifacts that were used to announce the new continent's discovery to all corners of the Three Kingdoms. He also learns that his confrontation with his teacher is already news in the entire academy. When the door raps, he realizes who his teacher in that class is. It's Gideon, who pretends that Arthur wouldn't be in his class. He spends the rest of the class boasting about all his inventions until a strange beast enters and lands on Arthur's shoulder. There, Gideon says that he must go see the headmistress. On the way, he comes across Kathleen, but she ignores him. Upon entering, he meets Goodski, who has a serious look. She invites him to take a seat. Arthur tries to explain to her what happened with the professor, but she says that she doesn't care, and she asks him if he wants to become the temporary teacher of that class. Arthur thinks that it's a joke, but he quickly thinks that Kathleen has something to do with it. Goodsy makes a joke about that, saying that she doesn't want him to steal both princesses' hearts and start a civil war. But Kathleen was the one who suggested that. Arthur says that he hasn't even finished his first day of class, and asks about what parents will think. Goodski replies that it's her school, her rules. So after thinking about it, Arthur accepts and he leaves. While he's leaving, Goodski and her Link observe him. The latter tells her that Sylvie's true identity is that of a dragon. Goodski is amazed, and as a warning, she advises him not to make him his enemy, because in the future he could be the one to destroy the continent. At the beginning of his next class, he comes across Curtis and Claire. But Tesha also comes in, who upon seeing how Claire is resting her shoulder on Arthur, becomes mad and ignores him. But someone else passes by his side, someone whose sole presence makes Arthur mad. It's Lucas. They cross looks and, suddenly, a mana beast descends from the sky. Next to it is the class teacher. Arthur tries to scan her level and she notices and does the same noting that he's hiding his level along with two elements. She approaches him with the intention of turning him into the center of attention to force him to show his power, and she achieves that, telling everyone that he's the new professor of mana manipulation practice. Curtis then suggests holding a simulated battle between three members of each team, and so, the disciplinary committee members and two members of the education committee will face each other, but they are one person short, so Lucas volunteers to fight. While they get ready, he has a small conversation with Tesha, who also notes that he's hiding his stronger elements. Arthur advises her to keep the secret, and he says that he really wants to see how much she has improved. The combat will have a 30-minute limit, and one last warning. The gear they have won't entirely protect them. They begin. They all split quickly and Arthur is left only with Lucas. Unleashing his incredible power for a moment, he puts his enemies on alert, and he starts his attack. After distracting him for a moment, Lucas is able to create a great fire dome, and he throws a blast of fireballs at him. With his body reinforced with mana, Arthur dodges the attacks, but without fire and water elements, it's hard for him to keep the rhythm. And in a place with low oxygen, it's even harder for him to manipulate the wind. He reaches a conclusion. He manipulates the wind in a zone close to his body in order to put out the fire before it touches him. Although it's not entirely perfect and it uses up a lot of mana, He's doing it, and he heads towards Lucas. When he feels that he's reaching his limit, he invokes his fire guardian. 
Arthur was about to finish him off, but in his head Sylvie warns him that Tesha is in danger. During the distraction, he is attacked, and he manages to see how the professor is heading towards Tesha at great speed, so he decides to use the first beast will face. The pain is unbearable, since he doesn't have much mana left. Thanks to that power, he's able to see how Curtis has also triggered his beast's will, and he's attacking Tesha. But he's falling while he presses on his breast without any defense. He heads towards her at great speed, but not having any mana left to block the attack, he decides to take the hit while he covers Tesha. Curtis apologizes because he didn't know that Tesha had fainted, but Glory comforts him. When the smoke clears, she is left stunned seeing Arthur cover Tesha. Up until a moment ago, he was fighting with Lucas. They immediately administer first aid. Arthur wakes up in a room, and the first thing he sees is Sylvie, who reproaches him for thinking he's the strongest one, but he was about to die. Suddenly, headmistress Cynthia comes in. She tells him that Tesha is fine for now. Arthur interrupts her saying that it's the mana beast, that her body can't bear it. She didn't know that Arthur had given it to her, but he says that it's his mistake not to have told the teachers about that, since the beast's assimilation moment is the most delicate one for a wizard. Finally, she thanks him for protecting her student and she leaves. Later on, after opening his eyes again, he sees his family. They're all more worried about what happened to the one who did this to him, and suddenly Tesha and her family also come in. They all have a good time, passing from Arthur's mother's insinuations about Tesha becoming his wife, to old Virians joking about how he obtained a Class S beast score. But the entire visit is brief, since there are many others still who want to see him. Some came because they wanted answers about what happened others to apologize, and others simply because they were worried about his health. The last to come was the inventor, Gideon. He says that he has prepared a gift for him on his personal training ground just so that Arthur will owe him a favor. But, unexpectedly, Tesha comes in again, smiling because Arthur almost died. But she's more worried for her than for him. Finally, she apologizes not for what happened, but for what will happen. Tesha leaves the room as fast as she can, but she still can't believe that she has kissed Arthur. And although she's anxious, she's also quite negative, saying that it's his loss if he didn't like it. On the other hand, Arthur is stunned. He can't believe that he has kissed a 13-year-old girl, and he thinks that he's a criminal. But he then remembers that in this new life, he's 12 years old. After a few days, Arthur leaves the hospital. Using a cane to help himself walk, he heads off to see his personal training room together with headmistress Cynthia and Gideon, who is impatient about showing him his new iron humanoid creation, with the power of a yellow core magician, although Arthur destroys it with a single blow. Below the city of Zyrus, in a previously unexplored dungeon, Barian dispatches a great number of beasts, beasts that, for some strange reason, are twice their normal size. In his hands, he holds a banner with some emblems, emblems unknown on this continent. Three days went by after that incident. During that time, Arthur was training to exercise his body. But the time has come for him to teach his first class. He's not entirely ready, so while he is heading towards his class, Kathleen helps him. When he arrives, everyone is stunned to see him arrive with the princess so close by him. But there are many who don't accept that Arthur should be a professor. So a student challenges him, thinking that anyone who defeats him will be able to become a professor. The rest of the students support him. But it was enough to unleash a bit of his power to shut everyone up. Starting his class, he shoots some basic questions about the way in which conjuring and augmenting wizards use mana. After getting a couple of right answers, he calls three conjuring and three augmenting wizards, and he makes them cast a spell. He then orders the augmenting wizards to shoot the spell and the conjuring ones to absorb it, something which makes no sense to anyone, since it's common knowledge that once a spell has been cast, it's impossible for a conjurer to absorb it, or for an augmenting wizard to shoot it. But Arthur gives them a small demonstration. Being an augmenting wizard, he shoots a wind spell with a descending potential, which leaves everyone stunned. He then calls the rest of the students to try. The only one who got close to doing it was Kathleen. When his class ended, many left frustrated, and many others left wanting to try it again. While he was sitting, Kathleen shows up, and she asks for his permission to sit next to him. Arthur jokes for a bit with her, but they then have an awkward silence, until she tells him that she has something important to tell him. Arthur, remembering the headmistress' words, thinks that he doesn't want to cause a fight between humans and elves. But quite differently from what he imagined, she apologizes for what happened at the auction house four years ago. She felt that she owed him an apology for her father's bad behavior. After leaving it clear that it wasn't necessary, he heads towards his next class, which goes by in a blink. After finishing, Elijah arrives running, telling him that the headmistress wants to see him in her training room. Arriving there, he only meets Tesha. Since the kiss, he has avoided seeing her, but they proceed with the beast assimilation. Since he's a four-element wizard, he can help any wizard, and he can serve as a battery while Tesha uses the majority of her mana, instead of trying to take control over the beast. 
When they finish, Tesha asks him if he's angry with her for having kissed him. Arthur's frustration shows, and he handles the topic with a little humor, avoiding answering. This bothers Tesha, who gets up and leaves. But before leaving, she tells him that he's good at fighting and magic, but not at everything. That's why she tried to soothe his feelings, even when he knows what she feels for him. She also says that everyone who's close to him notes how he wears a mask and pretends that he's happy all the time. Tesha's words were spinning inside his head. He even tried clearing his mind by training a little, but it was impossible. However, he is interrupted by Professor Glory, who went looking for him and Tesha. After finding out that she's not there, she makes Arthur go to his last class, but not without first thinking about why someone like him has such a colossal training room. The rest of the day was no different. He couldn't even pay attention to everything since he was thinking about Tesha. At night, while he was going towards his room, three shadows appeared behind him. Lucas, together with two students, orders Arthur with a menacing attitude to tell him how he escaped from his fire domes, and where Tesha is, under one second. Arthur tells him that he doesn't have anything to say to him. Lucas simply says that it's surely because of an artifact that Tesha gave him. At that moment, Marquois, one of his companions, starts exuding mana uncontrollably while he says that he used the same tricks to seduce Princess Kathleen, and that she only deserves a nobleman like him, since she picked up his handkerchief. Lucas only smiles while he watches him go insane, and he then attacks Arthur. His strength is above normal, and his mana fluctuation is abnormal. Lucas, acting like the victim, and washing his hands off the situation, retreats. Arthur tries to protect himself with a wind shield. But it's useless, Marqua has completely lost his mind. While Arthur was considering what to do, Sylvie transforms into her dragon form and leaves him unconscious with a single blow. Claire then arrives, and uncovering his back, some glowing mana runes can be seen running down Marqua back. Next, Claire tells him that he's not the first one. While he was recovering, there was a similar case, and as they are entering the headmistress' office to inform her of what happened, they come across two other people. These are Spears Baron and Aaliyah. After exchanging a few words with Cynthia, Baron's eyes meet Arthur when he's exiting. Sylvie warns him that both are too strong. After explaining everything that happened to Cynthia, Arthur suspects that she knows something about the marks, but she doesn't reveal any information. After telling her that the discipline committee members will do some patrolling after classes, they leave. While he is on his way, he sees how Lucas is being rebuked by his brother, Spear Baron, so he decides to hide in order to spy them for a moment. If he wants to kill Lucas, he must first become stronger to defend himself from Baron, and he releases a bloodthirst. With no time to react, Spear Aaliyah puts her weapon on his neck, and she comments that that is a fairly strong bloodthirst, but he won't be able to do anything to Baron, even if he is a two-element wizard. She also tells him that he's one of the most powerful spears, and that there is a great difference between them even though she's also a white core wizard. Before parting, she says that if her brother was still alive he would be his age, and she strokes him lightly on the head. On the following day, the discipline committee members have a meeting where it is announced that Marqua died. They weren't able to control his mana loss. However, they are certain that the marks on his back had something to do with it. But no information was revealed to them, and they organized new groups to patrol at night. Later, that same day, after falling asleep in Gideon's class, he reproaches Sylvie for not waking him up to go to his next class. When he arrives, Professor Glory says that she won't take any risks until he's healed entirely, so she makes him rest in a booth, where he meets Tesha. Tesha breaks the ice saying that he doesn't have to give any explanations. She overreached and she said things that she shouldn't say. Arthur tells her that it's easier to deal with magic and with training than with feelings, since feelings can't be trained, and also that he can't have a relationship with her. Or at least not for now, maybe when they're older. Tesha then jokes, telling him that if he's not sure, she will wait for him, and she asks him if she can trust him, telling him that she won't go out with anyone else. Arthur tells her only to give him some time, and he kisses her on the forehead. He keeps a poker face the rest of the day, and Sylvie makes fun of him. On the other hand, Tesha is also thinking about the kiss and she pictures what their children would be like. At night, when they were on patrol, Arthur and Theo catch two students who were scribbling on the walls with messages against elves and dwarves. As soon as Theo left with the two captives, Arthur felt someone's presence, and he hid. Looking at the stranger, he noticed the runes on his back, and he went quickly after him, following him closely, so that he would lead him to his lair. But Kai's appearance foils his goal, since the latter screams his name and alerts the other student. However, at that same moment, his transmission dagger turns on. It's a help signal from Theo. Arthur is already suspicious about Kai, but he will look into that some other time. Curtis and Doradri arrive with Theo. He says that someone attacked him from behind and left him unconscious, but he was able to wound his assailant in the arm. It must be someone strong to be able to knock out someone like him. Remembering his encounter with Kai, he had a bandage on his hand. 
The next day, he wasn't able to pay attention in his classes since everything seemed suspicious to him, including Kai's demeanor. Despite searching again, they didn't find anything. But he was able to clear his mind while he was helping Tesha with the assimilation of her mana beast. They then had a good time together, but they're interrupted by the headmistress, who comes in with various wounds. Tesha runs to help her, but she says that it's nothing. She just had an encounter in order to release stress. Arthur has been suspecting for some time that she's hiding something but he doesn't know if it's good or bad. Spears Aaliyah, Baron, and the strongest one, Vere, have an emergency meeting to take new measures. The piece of cloth that Baron found is made of a mana beast that is either unknown or from another continent. But the most unusual thing is the diversion of large bloodworm packs, from which it follows that something made them change course. Aaliyah, as one of the best sensory wizards, will be tasked with investigating. On the following day, Elijah is training with Toby. He throws some rock spikes at him, but Toby dodges them and before making another move, Elijah manages to knock him down. When he thought he was done, the automaton throws a fire spell at him, but Arthur saves him with a direct hit, and he says that Gideon sneaks in at night to add new features to his creation. Elijah is interested, but he says that doesn't attract girls. Arthur makes fun of him and he throws a wooden spear at him so that he can practice with him. He's impressed by his skill, steady steps, always balanced, moves that take little time, together with his unusual metal magic. He could be a great warrior, but he decides to knock him down and he gives him his hand. Elijah, turning, sees a figure behind Arthur. He had blonde, short hair, and he was wearing a military suit. A storm of feelings starts to consume him, wrath, guilt, rage, envy, treason, all in an instant. The feelings intensify, and he starts to scream, everything being accompanied by a big headache. Arthur tries to help him, but he doesn't know what's happening. Before he can take him to the infirmary, he decides to get up and tell him that he will see him in the room. Days go by, and each day when he wakes up, he tries to spend a good time with the new people that he has met. But the only one who has changed is Elijah. From that day on, he appears distant, and it seems as if he's upset at Arthur all the time. Even Sylvie notices. After helping Tesha with her assimilation, she's confident about the dungeon raid that they will do the next day. But Arthur warns her not to be too confident. She hasn't recovered all her strength yet, and it may be dangerous. Although he was joking, she tells him not to treat her like a girl. But Arthur reminds her of his words when he met her. She throws him over and she starts hitting him while on top of him. But a voice interrupts them. Old Virian has come to see his granddaughter. But he jokes that he didn't know she was already a grown woman. Tesha, realizing this, stands aside and asks him to stop making those jokes. She asks him to come with her on the raid, but Arthur tells her that it wouldn't be a problem. However, she must visit her family that evening, so Virian finds the way to bring Tesha with him. Below, on the beast clearing, Spear Aaliyah traverses a dungeon. She discovers a usual pattern that has been left by the blood worms, and that they all lead to a single place. So she decides to go in, and she comes across a Hades serpent. But something unusual happens to her. A dark aura engulfs her. She's well known for not taking care even of her offspring, but she's watching over the entrance to a tunnel that is emanating great amounts of mana. So she contacts Spear Vere, who tells her that he will send a 50 battle wizard squadron. She just has to wait. When Arthur gets home, his family is waiting for both of them. They realize that he will go get the gifts. The night went by, and they all had a pleasant time. Arthur takes his sister to her room and Tesha has a chat with Arthur's mother. She asks her whether she's worried about Arthur. She tells her that even if he becomes stronger than all the spears together, she will worry about him, since dungeons can be unpredictable. On the other hand, Arthur tells his sister about how he became a professor until they fall asleep. When they arrive at the beast's clearing, Sylvie tells Arthur that she's going hunting. In that way, they all go into the dungeon. Entering, Arthur notices that he doesn't need to cover his body in mana to avoid the cold, thanks to his new beast will. But there's something weird in that dungeon. They don't find any beasts on the first two levels. When Professor Glory was thinking about exiting, a large number of trackers appeared in front of them, which forced them to retreat. However, Lucas is reluctant to retreat, and he shoots an attack next to Glory, and they all are in agreement with him in order to test their skills. So they form small combat groups. Although they don't have troubles, they're unused to long battles, and the number of roamers doesn't decrease. So Glory orders again a retreat, but two beasts of great size appear in front of them. Glory launches into attack to win time, and she orders Arthur to find an exit path. So with the help of some Earth spell, they create a path. But they have another problem. A large amount of rocks is covering the exit, 
and if that weren't enough, the beast stench is building up, and they are running out of oxygen in a closed space. That's why she cautions not to use fire. She then calls on Curtis to use his celestial fire attack to clear the way, but he doesn't have much mana, so Arthur takes off his suppressor, and he transfers some fire mana to Curtis. Ready, Curtis releases his attack. With everything in place, they start to retreat, but a quake startles them. A beast even larger than the previous ones appears. It exudes a sinister aura. Its strength is enormous, and glory is no match for it. Therefore, Arthur prepares to fight, although Curtis tries to stop him. But his arm gets covered in blue fire, leaving Curtis and Claire stunned. Together with Glory, they start to attack the beast. Glory tries to win some time, while Arthur prepares his attack. After a wind and lightning combination, he creates a lightning hurricane. But his arm gets dislocated. The attack did have an effect, but not the one he expected. The beast is still attacking them, so Glory takes Arthur away. But he doesn't manage to pull his sword from the beast's body. After thinking that they had left the beast behind, it reappears, and with one of its claws it pierces Arthur's leg, self-destructing after that. Arthur falls into a cliff, and a rock leaves him half unconscious. With a wind attack, he manages to cushion the fall, but he suffers a lot of damage. But thanks to his beast will, a great part of the damage disappears. Now the only thing left is to find a way out of there, which seems easy since he finds a cave that emits light. But he never imagined what he would find on the other side. Several masked battle wizards, the majority of which are pierced by some black iron spikes. A voice is asking for help. Every way he looks, there are only masked corpses, until he finds the voice's source. Spear Aaliyah is blind. She has a gap on her breast, and if that weren't enough, she's missing her legs. Arthur tries to infuse mana into her core, but it's completely shattered. Aaliyah asks him where he knows her from. Arthur says that they met before in the academy. She tells him not to try anything, since her core is broken. Arthur asks who is capable of doing that. She gives him a small black artifact, and she tells him that thanks to the little mana that she gave him, she will show him who's responsible for this. After waiting for the attack squadron to arrive, they kill the Hades serpent. But when they extract its core, it disintegrates. Entering the cave, they find a being with two onyx horns protruding from its head, and it ejects some dark mana, killing several wizards in one instant. It then tells them that they have two choices, die fighting or kill each other. It will allow to live whoever is left standing last. But this is not an option for anyone, and the beast starts attacking them. And as if they were completely insignificant, it kills the majority of the soldiers, summoning those black iron spikes from the ground. But Aaliyah manages to harm it and she takes one chunk off its horn, which she gives to Arthur. The beast says that it doesn't care what they do to it, since the war is close. It rejoices in saying that it was once told that when the body loses one sense, another sense improves, and it tears out Aaliyah's legs and leaves. The pain is unbearable, and Aaliyah simply asks to be killed. The scenes are harrowing, and Arthur vomits because of what he just saw. The spear breaks, letting Arthur see her fear, and she says that she doesn't want to die. Arthur can only hug her, but that is not enough, and in that same moment, Spear Aaliyah of Dickathan dies. Looking inside the rest's memories, the same image would always repeat itself, the being that resembles a demon. Arthur creates tombs for the fallen ones, and for Aaliyah, an ice tomb. Sylvie waited patiently in her dragon form, and then they set off back to Zyrus. Arthur went straight to his house. In front of his house, he doesn't think he'll be able to enter. He knows that everyone is worried for him, but he doesn't think he can tell them what happened. Aaliyah's words still ring in his head, her anguish and her fear of death. For one second, he wishes that she may have the same luck as he and be able to enjoy a second life. A few steps are heard behind. It's his father, who tells him that he doesn't have to explain anything. Life is not a single battle, it's fine to lose sometimes and learn from that to stand up again, and be able to become stronger to win the war. And for the first time in a long time, Arthur yields to his feelings and he starts crying under the night aurora of Zyrus. Next morning, at the academy, he gives headmistress Cynthia Aaliyah's medallion. The horror in her face is quite evident, and she asks if he saw the one who did this. When Arthur says no, she tells him not to get further into this. It's already in the council and the other spear's hands. Arthur decides to take the day off and he goes shopping with his family. But it's evident in his face that not everything is fine, so he asks where the closest magic artifact shop is located in order to clear his mind. Tabitha tells him that a few streets up there is a famous elixir shop. But when he gets there, he finds a sordid establishment. But a voice puts him on alert. An old man is sitting on the floor and he asks him for a coin. And in an instant, he snatches the coin away from him. And when he tells him that that's not the one that he wanted, the old man disappears. When he tries to open the door, he must use a great amount of mana. Inside was the same old man from a moment ago. He tells him that he can pick something of the same value as the coin. And despite looking in every corner, he doesn't find anything that persuades him. 
but a small cat draws his attention. Its eyes seem to come from another galaxy and just as fast as it appeared, it went away. At that point Sylvie arrives and the old man is left in trance looking at her. Not finding anything that interests him, Arthur decides to leave. But the old man gives him a small white orb, and he tells him that he'll need it later. Leaving, they come across the cat again, which smiles at both of them before leaving. Underneath the Zyrus Academy, Lucas is welcomed into a small nobleman cult that opposes the union with the elves and the dwarves, so they treat Lucas with contempt. But before they can do anything, their leader incinerates them. Lucas is interested in him, since he can't feel his core's color. He tells him that he needs him for his plan to succeed, since he's got the council and the headmistress busy. He only needs him for his plan to be perfect. He offers him the same marks that Marqua had, he was weak. If he accepts, he'll be able to beat Arthur Lewin. Arthur is received by Elijah with a hug when he arrives at the academy. He was worried about him, but not just him. Claire and Curtis sustain slight wounds, and Tesha is in her training room, so he decides to go. While he's getting close, he feels Tesha's out-of-control mana. Virine was next to her, but Tesha is wrapped in a vine cocoon that starts to attack Arthur. It seems like the mana beast is taking control over Tesha's core, and it resents Arthur for having killed it. But when he wanted to unsheathe its sword from its ring, the only thing that comes out is the white orb that the old man gave to him, and it goes inside Tesha's body, who gets her mana overflow under control. After taking her to the infirmary, she says that she's fine, but that something happened to her core. Virion, inspecting her, notes that Tesha is at the initial stage of a silver core. Advancing three stages in one stretch is an exhausting blow for the body, so they let her rest. Arthur uses the opportunity to ask how strong the spears are, to which Virion replies that ten platinum core wizards are required to attempt to face a white core wizard, and that even that doesn't guarantee their victory. Victor says that what he's about to tell him, he can't tell anyone. Hundreds of years ago, humans, elves and dwarves were nomads. They only met to trade, but they had an alliance. However, life was hard for everyone because of the mana beasts, which considered them prey. After several years, the numbers of the three races dropped, until a deity descended from heaven, which gave six artifacts to the ancestors of the current royal families. They had to pick two of their most powerful warriors in order to be named knights after a soul vow, and be able to access the artifacts that gave them the ability to control mana. They were the ones tasked with spreading that knowledge, the first generation of wizards being born thus. Together, they were able to banish the beasts into what is known today as the Beast's Clearing. Then, they all took different paths. After several generations, their descendants forgot about their alliances, which triggered the war from 100 years back. But the spears have always been in hiding and close to the royal families. However, their existence was only made public because of the discovery of the new continent, in order to give hope to the population and calm them. But should it be revealed that there are artifacts capable of creating white core wizards, there would be chaos among the families that want power. He also reveals that Sylvie is a deity, but she's not the sort of thing considered a deity by religious texts. Instead, she is a being capable of harmonizing entirely with mana. Such beings are capable of attaining unreachable power levels. He also gives him a warning. The world is changing and he must be ready for the role that such a change will play. Arthur heads to the old artifact shop's location, but the shop has disappeared. Instead, he finds another orb and a note, which tells him to go to the transport portal to Elenoir. Next morning, after having breakfast with his family, he heads towards the portal, but when enters, something weird happens. Some monobines trap him and drag him to a dark place. Sylvie transmits her fear to him, but a great amount of mana makes them lean. In front of him are a pair of eyes that he had already seen. Then, everything turns white. The same dark cat with the galactic eyes appears. After saying that they'll finally be able to have a calm chat, it turns into a human. He's taller than normal and he has pale skin, and his hair is gold, almost white, and he introduces himself, my friends and brothers call me winsome, but beings like you call me god. Cynthia heads to Zyrus after having a meeting with the council, but she is attacked from the back, some wizards with runes on their spines. They all have their eyes bandaged. She quickly knocks out the majority with her sound magic, and she knocks down the rest with her wind magic. Suddenly, her beast transforms and starts devouring them. She asks one of them what their plans are, but he says that he will never say anything to a traitor. There are spies infiltrated throughout the continent, and the war is about to start. Before he says anything else, Cynthia kills him. When she pours an elixir to heal her wounds, Cynthia reveals the runes on her spine. Arthur is nervous. He can feel that the being before him is immensely more powerful than the spears. But before starting their chat, he asks him if something happened with Tesha or Virion, since he made him go to the portal that leads to Elenoir. The being called Winsome tells him that it was just a coincidence, and both are fine, thanks to the orb, which prevented Tesha's core from exploding. He tells him to keep the other, since it's a gift for him. Then, with magic, he summons a projection of the world. He tells him that Dickathan is not the only continent. 
There's another one called Alacria, and both are ruled by them, who live in the continent called Ephiatus. Although historically lesser beings have called them deities, they call themselves Asuras. They never intervene with the lesser beings unless peace or balance is threatened. Ephiatus is divided into three factions, each formed by multiple clans of different races. The dominant clan of each faction has its own privileges, but they have all stayed on the sidelines and they don't interfere with the minor races. However, everything changed when Agrona became the leader of the Vritra clan. They broke that rule to try to get closer to the humans, but then it was discovered that they had been experimenting on the humans of the Alacria continent to find a way to improve their skills. Arthur, after hearing him, tells him that that has nothing to do with him. Winsome agrees with him and he makes Sylvie transform into her dragon form. He then tells him that he is linked to the granddaughter of the most powerful being in the three continents. Her lineage makes her fearsome even among the Asuras themselves. And although the pride of the higher-ups at Ephiatus prevents them from admitting it, his link to Sylvie makes him a key piece for winning the war. So, as long as he agrees to cooperate with them, they won't separate him from Sylvie. Arthur tells him that the war on that continent concerns his family and friends, so he's obliged to participate. What he really must ask him is if he's willing to be a pawn under his command. Winsome tells him that he's smarter than he'd thought, and to get ready to go train in Ephiatus. Only in that way will he become stronger and be able to give hope to this continent. On the other hand, the committee members have an emergency meeting. The acts of discrimination between races have drastically increased, and they still know nothing about Arthur. But they are interrupted by Elijah. Before he can tell them that Arthur is alive, the sound of a great explosion puts them on alert. The Triunion Hall, a symbol of peace and unity between the three races, is burning. Quickly, with the help of a professor, they manage to put out the fire. But the damage is done. Charles, a nobleman and a member of the Radicals, is the main suspect. But the committee members are prevented by the professors from doing anything without proof. Elijah is training. His control over Earth magic is better than before, but he's not very efficient. His several feelings against Arthur are still present, but he remembers that Arthur was always by his side when he needed him, so he will become stronger to be on his level and be able to stay by his side. Meanwhile, Arthur arrives at the palace in Elenoir. A quake alerts him, and then part of the castle is destroyed. Virion then appears and tells Arthur that Tesha has completed her beast's assimilation, but she still can't control its power, so they both activate their beast will. Virion goes into the second phase and he cuts the vines, while Arthur goes directly towards Tesha. He manages to calm her down and her power overflow stops. Seeing the damage they have caused, Virion tells them it's time to go, but he doesn't say where. While Tesha sleeps, Virion tells him that she was too confident when she told him that she wanted to activate the beast's will's first phase. But her assimilation being too fast, everything went out of control. Arthur feels that the beast inside Tesha is different, something is happening with her. But he says that he will do everything he can to be by her side and protect her. Taking advantage of this, Virion asks him if he loves his granddaughter. Arthur says yes, but he doesn't know if what he feels is love or fraternal love, a feeling that one has for one's family members. But he will find out in time, and when he's ready, he will ask for permission to marry his granddaughter. Tesha, who had been faking being asleep, doesn't know what to do with what she just heard. When they get off the carriage, the elf kings are waiting, but nobody knows why they are there, until Virion tells them that they will go see Rhaenya because he wants to see Arthur's future. On the way, Tesha's father thanks him again for having saved his daughter. It was thanks to him that he was able to interact with humans again. Her mother was one of the victims of the war with the humans, and they abducted his daughter later, which engendered in him contempt towards them. But a four-year-old human boy not only saved his daughter and brought her back to her home, he was even able to indict his attitude, so he says that he has his blessing if he wants to marry his daughter. But they are interrupted by Rhaenya, whom Arthur attacks because he thought that she was a monster. When they arrive at her lair, she puts everyone to sleep with a sleep agent, since she wants to speak in private to Arthur, and she explains how her powers work. Deviating magicians control mana in a different way. They don't use the environment mana, they use their own mana reserves. One example is his mother. Her healing spell is very different from the rest, but for diviners, it's even stronger. They don't use mana to see the future. Each time they see the future, their lifespan is reduced. Her sister Rania, Virian's wife, was an even more powerful diviner than her. She came to be the pride of all Elenoir. After marrying Virian, a beautiful future awaited them, or that's what they thought. The war between elves and humans was approaching its end, but the tension was still evident. And there was something else. Rhaenya later saw that the human king's plan was to kill the elf that was the heir to the throne. So she tried to change the path of the future again and again. But nothing changed. Virion would end up dying in different ways each time that she used her power. Years of her life were lost, until the future changed and the current human king killed his father and the war ended. Shortly afterwards Rhaenya died. Now Rhaenya used the same power to see Arthur's future. The world is changing, and wherever she looks, Arthur is at the center of everyone. 
He will suffer a lot in the future. No matter what he does, it will be like that. So she says only two things, people do bad things for good reasons, and sometimes the most powerful enemy is not the one who wields power over a throne, but an abandoned soldier who has nothing left to lose. Without revealing anything else, she tells him to rest. Everyone, upon waking up, says goodbye to Rinia, who says that she spoke with Arthur while they all had a small rest. And thanks to a personal portal, Arthur and Tesha go back to Zyrus. When he gets home, they welcome him. Jasmine is there, together with the rest of the twin horns. Tesha tells him that she has matters to deal with in the academy, and they say goodbye. Together, they all remember the old stories, and they drink too much. But as is usual in this story, good times don't last long. The committee gets ready for a team training session. Kai is preparing the barrier to avoid causing excessive damage. But something weird happens with the barrier, its color and shape are abnormal, and they quickly ask Kai to deactivate it. But she doesn't seem to hear them on the other side. So they look for the internal switch to deactivate it. But it is disconnected. Suddenly, they receive an attack from a group of wizards who enter without any trouble. Among them is Lucas. His appearance is sinister, and he says that they're stupid for realizing that this was a trap set by Kai. With a fast move, he places himself in the middle of everyone, and he does an attack and splits them. Claire tries to attack him, but even his fire guardian is abnormal, and nobody can do anything against him. But he stops abruptly when he receives a message. His target is approaching. Claire finds an opening in the barrier, but Kai and Doradria stay to win time. But outside everything is worse. The students are being attacked by rabid mana beasts. Tesha is arriving at the academy, and she feels a tremor. Getting off the carriage, she sees how a large barrier covers the entire academy, and her carriage is hit by an attack. Lucas has arrived to capture her. Her body is not entirely well. The beast's magic is under control thanks to the bracelet that Rinia gave her, but that's also suppressing her mana, so no attacks will affect Lucas. He tells her that she looks better silent, and that in time, she may like him more than her boyfriend. Tesha realizes that his plan is to capture her and use her as bait to attract Arthur, so she tries to buy time and she removes the bracelet. The mana goes out of control, and it manages to harm him. But that is not enough, since Lucas expels fire mana and he manages to knock her down. He then grabs Tesha by the hair and he drags her into the barrier. Inside, Elijah fights several mana beasts, but things become complicated for him since he's attacked from all sides. But he pierces them with his ground spikes. The hooded fiends are only attacking the elves and dwarves, and they force the humans to join them to avoid having their core destroyed as a punishment. Among them there are also some professors. Elijah and Curtis manage to make them flee, but a voice transmission alerts them, and it calls everyone to gather in front of the clock building. When they arrive, there are several wounded and dead people. Desperation took hold of everyone. Inside a barrier, the revolutionary's leader tells them that he doesn't understand why they want to fight after the deaths they have witnessed, and he throws something at them. It's Doradria's head. Elijah throws up and he can't believe what he's seeing. Theo arrives and he challenges him to fight. He removes the mask, and he introduces himself. His name is Draniv, and he accepts his challenge. Theo attacks with all his power and he seems to have harmed him, but he's the one who was harmed. After mocking him, he kills Theo with a single attack. Claire grabs Curtis so he can't do anything. He feels impotent about not being able to do anything, and Kathleen tells him that he will only manage to get himself killed. Behind Draniv chained elves enter, among them Faerith and Tesha. Draniv continues with his speech. He comes from a different continent, a very cruel place for the weak. That's why he went to the academy, where they told him that he would find Dickathan's elite. But, in comparison, they are trash. So he will pick the most talented ones, to give them power and prepare this land to be ruled by their lord. One example of them is Lucas, who rejoices in saying that Tesha was too weak. In response, Elijah explodes with rage, and he shouts about how he could do something like that to her, and he exudes a dark and sinister mana, accompanied by black iron spikes. This was the birth of something very dangerous for Dickathan's future, and especially for Arthur Lewin. His eyes turned red. A black fire formed in his hands, capable of consuming even non-existence, anything that it may touch. In that way, he manages to cross the barrier. Corrupt mana beasts approach him, but he kills them as if they were insignificant with these iron spikes. The mana that he exudes is more intense each time, and he thinks in his mind that this is not him. A group of wizards goes behind him, but Draniv stops them. Elijah suffers a collapse, but he shoots a spike towards Lucas, which pierces his shoulder. He is stunned by the surprise, but Elijah vanishes. At that point, Draniv seizes him, and some nostalgia shows in his face. A group of professors takes advantage of the situation to enter, thanks to how Elijah opened a section of the barrier, and they attack. Draniv decides that something unexpected has arisen, and he must retreat to his continent, taking Elijah, but not without first ordering Lucas to eliminate everyone and telling him to follow him across the portal. 
Glory is able to defeat the beasts, but there are many wizards to fight with. At that moment, a group of students led by Claire helps them. Her goal is to go after Kai. On her way, she dodges some earth spikes, but Kai traps her with her iron threads. But something weird happens. The threads let go, but she's still hanging. Curtis and Kathleen scream while they head towards her. She doesn't understand what's happening until she decides to look down and she sees how an earth spike pierces her chest. But at that same moment, an immense mana overflow puts everyone on alert. There are terrified faces watching what is approaching. But Claire sheds some tears and a smile appears on her face. Arthur Lewin has arrived, and behind him comes a majestic beast. Two sharp horns protrude from its head, its scales are bright, obsidian color. Its eyes glow with ferocity, but there was something more fearsome than the dragon. Each step was full of confidence, and his body exuded a very intense rage, and above everything else, a violent rage. Claire only regretted that she wouldn't be able to see Luca's expression when he is massacred. Lucas feels a great fear. He wouldn't have imagined the power of what is before him even in his nightmares. He tries to provoke Arthur, but the latter only goes past him, completely ignoring him. The first thing he does is check Tesha's vitals, but Lucas continues provoking him. Sylvie responds with a roar, but Arthur continues ignoring him. He decides to go face him, but he stops abruptly. He started to feel an irrational fear. Arthur finally shifts his attention to him. He tells him that he always thought of him as a worm who wasn't worth killing. But if that worm decides to be a nuisance, even the greatest saint wouldn't hesitate to crush him. Lucas felt how a force was seizing him. He can't believe that after what happened, Arthur is still stronger than him. So he summons two weird fireballs and he throws them. Arthur triggers his beast will second phase and, with his hand, he counters the attack with a bluish fire. Lucas summons a blue fire spear, but Arthur seizes it. In his right hand, he shoots a black beam which hits Lucas directly and makes him lose an arm. With no time to suffer, Arthur, with his left hand, takes his remaining arm and he freezes it until it shatters into a thousand pieces. Arthur keeps ignoring any word that comes out of Lucas and he goes on. This time, he destroys his left leg. Lucas, despite his situation, continues in his attempt to unsettle him, and he mentions that Elijah was captured by Draniv. But Arthur says that that is a matter for some other time, and he destroys the last limb of his that remained intact. Since his last life, he hadn't experienced being looked at by everyone because of his dominant strength, the fear, surprise and admiration. He had forgotten how solitary he was. After he deactivated his beast's will, he felt his body collapse. Lucas cried for his brother, and behind him, there was a flash of mana, three spears have just arrived. Lucas dies in front of his brother. Baron succumbs to his rage and he attacks. Arthur doesn't have mana to defend himself, so Sylvie charges against the spears, but Arthur orders her not to attack them. At that moment, Barry captures Sylvie and the dwarf spear, Alfred, summons a magma golem that helps in the evacuation. But Baron is in front of Arthur and he says that death is not enough for someone like him. However, Alfred stops him and he says that he saved everyone else from his brother's attack. Baron ignores him and he goes after Arthur. But a golem grabs him from behind. Baron frees himself with a fire and lightning attack and he's about to kill Arthur. But Barry summons some ice swords and he immobilizes him. He says that a trial will determine his future together with that of the dragon. The evacuation continues. Many lives were lost, and they give first aid to those who need it. Arthur, after being treated, is handcuffed by Vere. But just to be sure, they chain his mana core to prevent him from using magic. Arthur asks them to free his link. Vere looks at him surprised when he learns that this boy has a link with a dragon. Sylvie reverts to her miniature fox form. While he's being transported, misinformation spreads and the nobles blame Arthur for what happened. At that point, his family arrives. Barry gives him permission to speak to them. Arthur tries to calm them down, saying that soon he will clear up this misunderstanding. But in that instant, Barry receives a message from the committee. Under the authority vested in me by the Council of Dickathan, I, Barry Ori, announce the decision taken on the case, which will be put into execution immediately. Arthur Lewin, having committed acts of excessive violence, and having participated in the deplorable events that occurred at the Zyrus Academy, will be deprived of his wizard status, and his core will be confiscated. And until he has been properly tried, he will be put under arrest. After Vary's announcement, Arthur's family can't believe what's happening. Many witnesses wonder why they made that decision. But only Princess Kathleen reproaches the spears telling them that he saved all of them, and if he hadn't done something like that, until they arrived, they could all have died. She also says that she will talk to her parents to fix all of this, but Vary shows her the council's scroll with the Kings of Sap and Seal, approving Arthur's arrest, accepting that he can't do anything to persuade Vary. Arthur asks for permission to say goodbye to his family and he repeats his words, saying that he will leave for some time until he clears up this misunderstanding, trying to calm them down in that way. 
but this time, it's his father who comforts him, saying that no matter what the rest say, they will always be waiting for his return with open arms. Spear Alfred conjures a magma beast and he tells Arthur to climb on it, it's cooler than it seems. Together, they head away from Zyrus. Barry is in front of them, and he is carrying Sylvie in a small summoned orb. Arthur tells him that he doesn't understand why they put so many restrictions on him. He's not dumb enough to face two spears. Alfred tells him that they are over the beast's clearing and they can't risk him escaping. Even with all their power, they must proceed with caution, since there may be dangers that even they aren't capable of facing. While they were lost in their conversation, they arrived at the Three Kingdoms Council's floating castle. Any use of any kind of magic is strictly prohibited, and Alfred gives him one last piece of advice, he can't speak to anyone, not even them, once he is inside the castle. After crossing some large corridors, they enter a hall, and in front of them are the kings of Dickathan's three races. Dossid, the dwarf king, reproaches him for vowing so slightly before them. He says that he should be on his knees, but the human king says that there are more important things to deal with. However, Tesh's father interrupts in order to thank Arthur for having helped the students, and above all, his daughter. But this time, the two dwarf kings, with an aggressive attitude, reproach the elf king for his attitude, and they tell him that the boy which they have here, taking advantage of the situation, committed atrocious acts in order to eliminate his rival, who belonged to a noble house. But the accusations don't stop, and they also say that in the future, he may be dangerous, and they must destroy his core so that he can't even use magic, and kill the dragon, to prevent it from being a danger to them. The human kings remain neutral in this respect, saying that they are thankful to him because he also saved their children. But that was not the right way of acting. However, the situation escalates between the two kings. When Arthur wants to say some words, he is ordered to be quiet in an aggressive manner, so much so that Alduin calls his spear so that they will be ready. But the situation comes to a halt, and without being able to defend himself, Arthur is locked in the dungeons. Alfred tells him that he will come regularly to bring him food. Until then, he should adapt to his new home. But a familiar voice gets Arthur's attention. Headmistress Cynthia is also locked. She's been there some days, and she is unaware of the attack at the academy, so he explains to her all that happened. She asks for details, what the leader looked like, and what was Luca's appearance. Arthur tells her everything he knows, and he tells her that he has reached a conclusion about her, but he hopes to be mistaken. Cynthia tells him that she would like to reveal everything but a sound curse prevents her. Even without saying anything important, the pain is unbearable. In another room in the same castle, King Glader is visited by Dossett. He tells him that he's not following the plan. Glader only tells him that his arguments were so absurd that it was impossible for him to accept them without raising suspicion. He reminds him that he's on his side to protect his family, and he should feel some guilt, since he's betraying his entire people. Dossett mocks him saying that it doesn't matter what they do, this continent is destined to lose the war, and his best choice is to join them, especially given the riches they will obtain, and how they will be able to keep their titles. Gladire says not to compare him to himself, and he stays alone, thinking that he could never be a great wizard, and he was jealous of those in his family who were born with talent for magic. But getting rid of a boy who was born with an exceptional talent for magic will be a great satisfaction to him. Arthur wakes up from a nightmare, and in front of him, Spiraya gives him a letter, and she tells him not to say anything. The letter is from the Elf King. In it, the Elf King says that soon the council will declare him and Cynthia guilty for the attack at the academy. She also says that she heard how Glader and Doss had planned to send him off with someone, and not to worry about his family, since Virian has sent them to a safe place. She apologizes for not being able to do more for him. The letter vanishes, and just then Baron arrives, saying that the council has made a decision. While they're waiting, Baron taunts him saying that once his sentence has been pronounced, he will take care of his family as he did with his brother. Arthur mocks him saying that it's not worth it for a spear to threaten a 13-year-old like that. Also, Luke is accepted voluntarily to be part of that, and to attack his partners. Baron throws him on the floor, and the door to the hall opens, where he manages to hear Cynthia's sentence, public execution. They manage to cross eyes briefly, but his time has come. The Dwarf Kings are the ones in charge of telling him that thanks to their benevolence, he will only lose his position as a wizard, and he will be jailed until further notice. Arthur asks what will happen to his link. Alduin tells him that upon losing his position as a wizard, he also will lose his link with any beast. Dossett also tells him not to worry, his link will be given to a more capable wizard, since a dragon is a rare thing that deserves to be by the side of a worthy wizard. With that, Arthur reaches the conclusion that they are allied with the Vritra clan, and he's taken again to his cell. 
but there was an unexpected companion there. Winsome was waiting for him, and he's holding Sylvie in his arms. The Dwarf Kings are celebrating that everything is going according to their plan, and that they were the ones selected to be the rulers of Dickathan's rebirth. The Queen asks him if the being that he spoke to was strong, and Dossid says that he was. He had never felt so much fear in his life. He was so powerful that he resembled a god, and he offered him riches and power that he'd never imagined. But someone interrupts them, a being with white hair that has an amethyst-colored eye on his forehead. In his hand, he has the body of a guard with a hole in his breast. He tells him that he was sent to eliminate the parasites, and he releases an intense mana blast. But at that instant, Alfred arrives to protect them. He summons five magma golems, but a single move was enough to destroy all of them. So Alfred covers himself with a magma armor, which burns so intensely that it resembles fire, and he goes into the attack. But even with all his power, he's unable to touch the being in front of him, and he's thrown against a wall. The being says that he possesses a power that may be useful for that continent's future, and he approaches him at a great speed, and with a single finger's attack, he leaves the spear out of the fight. He directs his attention towards the kings, but he receives an attack from Spear Micah from behind, who attacks by combining some gravity-based magic and bearing a giant earth hammer. But again, with a single finger, he shoots an attack that immobilizes Micah, and he redirects his attention towards the kings. But Micah gets up and she launches into the attack, intensifying her spells. But she's left stunned when she sees how the three eye being can move despite being under the most powerful gravity spell that she possesses. In a single instant, he defeated two of the most powerful wizards on the continent. Continent. The kings can't move out of fear, and they tell him that Agrona threatened them to make them cooperate with his plan, and they plead for their lives. The being tells him to break the vow that he has with the spears, and without thinking it, he breaks the collar that bound them. But things are not as he expected, and at that moment, the dwarf kings die. Winsome has Sylvie in his hands, and he rebukes Arthur. His courage in saving the academy members is admirable, but he must think about his safety, and especially Sylvie's safety. He also tells him that he doesn't understand why the one in charge took Elijah with him. Arthur tells him that when he gets out of there, he will find out. But Winsome again tells him that he's not thinking right about things. Elijah was taken to Alacria, and he's not able to escape from this prison. But even so, he wants to find the way to go to Alacria, which would be a big mistake, since setting foot there would mean a certain death. Arthur asks him what he must do. The Dwarf Kings are cooperating with the Vritra clan, and also the Human Kings, but the latter don't feel comfortable with their decision. Winsome is surprised by seeing that he deduced all that in a short time. But they are interrupted by Baron, who goes into attack after asking if he is the prisoner's friend. Winsome summons some weird spell in his hand, of an amethyst color, and he completely neutralizes the attack. Baron is surprised, but he attacks again. However, it is all again in vain and he falls on his knees. At that instant, Barry arrives, and he orders him not to do anything, since he's before a data, and no matter what he does, he will never be a match for him, and he says that they're waiting for them. When they arrive at the hall, the three remaining kings, Cynthia and the three-eyed being are there. Arthur becomes alert, but Winsome calms him down. When they start their meeting, the being introduces himself. His name is Aldir, and he was sent with Winsome to help give them a chance to win the war. He informs them that the traitors have been eliminated, and their spears are under his control, and that any mistaken choice they may have made before will be forgiven. The human kings are paralyzed with fear, but Glader asks, if they are so powerful why do they not end the war themselves? Alder tells them that a war among Asuras would lead to the world's collapse, and that they made a pact with the Vitra clan and their allies not to attack each other and not to intervene with lesser beings. Arthur asks if their actions against the dwarf kings is not a breach of that pact. Winsome explains that they are being attacked by inhabitants of a continent governed by an Asura, so Agrona is breaking the pact indirectly, but he will try not to become involved further. But Arthur also asks them about the horned beings with a colossal power. Alder shows interest in that, and he explains that those beings were lesser beings like them before, but they obtained their power gradually through constant experiments over the years. Together, they may face an Asura, but their numbers are limited, and Agrona won't risk losing his winning card. His role in the war will be to be the general of Dickathan's army to guarantee its victory. Arthur and Winsome split from the group, and he tells him that it's time to go say goodbye to his family, since he must begin his training in Ephiotis. On the way, he tells him how the Asuras of Ephiotis are organized. They are divided into eight races, and each race is made up of several clans, but only is chosen to be one of the eight great ones, and the Vritra clan belong to the Basilisk clan. He also tells him that what he's about to tell him is a secret even among the Asura elite. Some time ago, Sylvia was with an elite group carefully selected to kill Agrona. Sylvia infiltrated the group, and by the time they realized who she was, it was too late to take the dragon princess back to Ephialis. But when they arrived in Agrona's territory, nothing was as they expected. 
Agrona's allies and the lesser beings with powers that matched those of the Asuras were waiting for them. Agrona not only experimented on them, he also crossed races, creating powerful beings and completely crushing the elite dragon squad. In that way, Agrona himself went before Lord Indra, the king of the eight Asura races, and he told him that Sylvia had died. Indra became angry and he was about to start a large-scale war due to his daughter's death. But the other Asuras persuaded him to sign a peace treaty. Arthur concluded that the artifacts that make the spears powerful were provided by them to match Agrona's strength. But they finally reach his family's refuge. They all go out to greet him, and Rinia is with them. But after taking a break, Winsome gives him a signal, and Arthur asks to talk alone with his family. When they are alone, he tells them that since he was born in that world, he never knew how to start this conversation. His parents first think that it's either a joke or the result of a bump on the head. But his father gets serious and he asks them to be quiet in order to hear what the boy has to say. Arthur told them about the world where he used to live, about each detail in his role there, and also about the people that he met and what his life was like. During all that time, his parents didn't say a single word. But as time went by, his father started to interrupt him to make short questions, but his face didn't show any emotion. On the other hand, his mother didn't say anything, and she didn't move, until she lost track of time, and his father said that he now understood why he had such a precise skill in battle and a superhuman talent with magic. Arthur tells him that in his world he used something called Kai, which in essence is very similar to Mana, and that his battle skill is due to how he trained almost his entire life. But at that instant, his mother starts to laugh. Her face shows fear, disbelief, and above all else, she tries to persuade herself that everything is a very elaborate joke on his part, and that he shouldn't do something like that. Arthur tells her that none of what he said is a lie, and she starts to go hysterical, so he decides to leave them alone. After a while, his father comes out and he asks to speak alone with him. After moving away some distance, he tells him that his story has left him shocked, and that he knows he doesn't have a reason to lie to them. Arthur asks if he's fine, but his father reacts agitatedly. He says that he doesn't know how to treat him. Arthur, King Grey, everything is confusing. What he just told him isn't something that one can accept in one moment. He was originally a king, and older than him, and perhaps the moments they spent together weren't real, and he was just trying to act as they wanted him to. Especially with his mother, she never knew that she raised a grown man in the body of a baby as if he were her own son. And he hits a part of the cave, saying that he doesn't know if he's his son, since maybe he killed the baby in his mother's womb to take his place. Reynolds, realizing what he said, apologizes to him. But Arthur tells him that he doesn't know how reincarnation works, and that very probably, it was like that. He never found the moment to tell them, but now that he's leaving to train for years, he thought that it would be the best moment, since they will be apart. But now he regrets doing it. He tells him that he never had a family in his previous life. He became a powerful person that no one could match, but his personality was never good. But after arriving in this world, he learned things that he didn't know. Maybe he's not the most powerful wizard, but he's a better person than in his previous world. He thanks him for having taken care of him all that time, and also for having loved him as his own son. He says goodbye to Rinia, but she tells him not to go back to being the person he was. Winsome triggers a portal with his blood, but before leaving, Arthur asks him how he looks, and he tells him that his expression reminds him of Ephiatus warriors. They eliminate their feelings to be the most efficient in battle. They are transported to the Asura's land. They both walk on a bridge that reflects the sky, to their side. There is a row of cherry trees, until they get to the doors of a castle. To the side, there is a statue of two dragons, and an even bigger one on the top. Their wings cover almost the entire castle. Upon entering, two guards with gold scars on their faces look at Arthur with scorn, and they ask if it's fine that he's carrying Princess Sylvie like that. Winsome tells one of them that there is no trouble, and they enter a great hall together. At the end is Lord Indra sitting on his throne. His skin is pale, and his hair is even whiter than Winsome's. His eyes are purple, but he has a young face. Arthur doesn't feel any energy emanating from him, but suddenly his runes become activated, and he feels that he's burning. With a breath, he makes Sylvie disappear, and he tells him not to be tense, he only wants to meet his granddaughter. He tells him that her mana level is insultingly low, she hasn't been training the right way, so he decides that he will train her. He also tells him that he will tell him, through Winsome, when the time comes to go back to his land, and they leave. Arthur tells him that everything felt weird, and Winsome tells him that it's insulting for the Asura's pride to depend on a lesser being for this war, but he will be trained by the Asura's without any discrimination. In that way, they reach the cave of an old friend of Winsome's. Kadri, just like Aldir, belongs to the Fias clan of the Pantio race, and he will be his teacher in physical combat. 
Kadri is impressed when he learns that they were allowed to use an Aether Orb, an artifact that allows one to use the dragon's unique ability to use Aether. Aether is a substance that exists in the entire universe, and which allows one to control time and separate the soul from the body. A week went by since he began his training. Inside, time passes in a different way. Also, the damage that he suffers doesn't matter. It won't affect his real body, and he can only leave if he dies, something that he did many times. Kadri's training is intense, but he admires his mental strength, since not even young Asuras can stand the feeling of being constantly murdered. But he makes him rest for short periods of time, since if he lingers for too long, his real body will react to death merely as a pain caused by a cut, which can be dangerous. He also tells him that he will turn him into a great warrior, not only relative to the human standards, but also among Asuras themselves. Themselves. He constantly exposes him to a force known as the King's Force, which leaves him paralyzed by fear. A month has passed outside, but inside, he has been training for one year. He tells him that his skills are excellent, but they're focused on one-on-one -on -one combat. It's possible that in war, he will have to face the hybrids in groups, and he must control his mana reserves and use the right amount for each move. When he returns to his physical body, he sees an Asura child who will be his training partner. He is offended about training beside a lesser being, but Kadri makes him accept. Four months went by in the external world, but there, four years went by. With time, more Asira children joined, and Arthur was forced to fight four versus one, with the order to only defend himself. Kadri thinks that if he had been born as an Asura, he could have been among the most powerful. Arthur's training with Kadri has reached its end, but both Asuras are impressed by his capacity. It is forbidden to use the Aether Orb on a child, due to the mental exhaustion that it causes, and often the adaptation to the physical world takes a long time but it didn't cause any changes in him. On the way to his next training, Winsome gives him a letter from Dickathan revealing information about Alacria. There are four generals called Scythes, and they are all hybrids with Vritra blood. They have a retainer under their command. One of them was able to beat a Dickathan spear easily, so he can't imagine how powerful the Scythes are. Winsome gives him a list with the artifacts that he must get in a short period of time, and he gives him a rattle. He will have to be able to capture each beast without making the rattle sound. Without being able to complain more, Arthur jumps into his next training. Okay, we've been here for too long. This is how the first part of this manhua ends. Okay guys, if you like this video and you want the second part comment with the word life. Also subscribe to the channel, hit the bell and like the video. But most important, leave a comment below. That all for today.